Good morning to everybody, and thank you all for waiting for all of this. I really, really appreciate it. And um, thank you to Anne for asking me, and thank you to Sheila for setting all this up. And um, hopefully we're just going to have some fun talking about container gardening and vegetables. I think most of you are here because you want to grow food in a container. Is that correct? Okay, you all want to grow food. All right. We'll talk a little bit about some ornamentals and just basic container gardening, because whether you're doing ornamentals or food, you can do it all in containers. Containers can do anything. My favorite way to, is garden, to garden is containers because you, they are so versatile. First, as I said, you can do anything in them. Do you want me to wait till all this is out? Maybe I'll wait just a yeah, second. I'm almost done. Okay. okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Ooh. When did you, when did you uh, join the Master Gardener program? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, a little bit about myself. My degree is in medical technology, not in horticulture. So I was um, clinical lab director at our hospital for many years. I worked as a clinical lab scientist there for many years. I was, um, I was there for the first 18 years, director 10 years of that, and then went back for another five, crazy. And, but in the meantime, I always had this love of horticulture, and it became a hobby of mine. So, and, so I started at the hospital in 1976 and stayed there through like 90, 93, 94. <clears throat> and in the meantime, in about 1985, I took my very first Master Gardener course. Mm, I was sold. I was absolutely sold at that and just loved it. And so when I um, finally said I've had enough medical care, I left the hospital and wanted to start a container gardening business. And that's what I was going to do. And then I got talked into buying a garden center. Mm, was that nuts? But I had, so I owned it for four years and then transitioned in the landscape design and installation and did that for many years. But that having that nursery, I learned so much by having the garden center, and it only motivated me to learn more and more and more and read catalogs and textbooks and take every class and certification I could get my hands on through the state of Arizona. Eventually worked my way up to um, um, Arizona Nurserymen's Association certification and all sorts of things, but it was all just out of passion, true passion. So. Um, and then in the meantime, Cochise College had asked me, there, I don't know how many of you ever knew Bill Satoff over at Cochise College. Wonderful man, used to be in charge of the business technology and ag department. And he asked if I would come develop a course for gardeners. And so I called it Home Gardening in the High Desert and did that at Cochise College for several years while I was doing other things. And then in 2012, um, the then agent who was handling the Master Gardener program went on a sabbatical, and they asked me if I would come over and teach the Master Gardener course so they could keep the program going, because they didn't want to put it on hold. So that was just supposed to be for, you know, 16 weeks. So, so I did that and had a ball. I'll never forget my very first class in 2012. I remember all the faces. <clears throat> and then the gentleman that was on leave did not come back the following year, so they said, would you stay on one more year and keep teaching the class? And then, oh, and by the way, while you're teaching the class this second year, would you sort of start to coordinate a Master Gardener program? Okay. Well, then it turned into this, and I just lost my mind and couldn't think of enough projects to do. In fact, my whole Master Gardener group, whom I absolutely love, 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 um, they're always saying, Jan, could you quit thinking of projects? We're exhausted. We're, you know, en enough, enough already. Uh, we're already spread thin, enough. But I, I can't help it. it. We've got a lot going on, and it's a wonderful program. And we've even got one, two, two Master Gardeners here today. Two, three. I see three. Debbie walked in. Okay. And Kent's here. Kent's from this year's class, and Debbie's from last year's class, and Tiki's from several years ago. So anyway, it's, um, I, I, I adore that. So that's what I've been doing, and I, my husband keeps saying, so aren't you just about ready to retire? No. No. I still have lots to do. I'm not ready to close that chapter yet. So. Well, Jan, I want to interrupt you. Yes, please. Do you have any estimate of how many people you have put through the Master Gardener program? Well, I just finished my 11th class. Okay. And so what if you averaged 20? So it's 200, maybe-ish? Ish. This year, we, because we were able to, we had to do it on Zoom, we had, I let too many people in, but I loved it. We had 40 people in class this year, because normally we can only do 28 because we're limited by space. So, um, but this year we had 40, and oh my gosh, what a good class. Kent's in that class, they're all, they're very engaged, um, lots, of, lots of them already um, being active in our programs, and so it's been, it's been wonderful. Really enjoying it. 
Okay. And so just in. Oh, I already, yeah, you notice I already did. That's good. Oh, already dirt on the floor, but I have a broom in my truck. Oh, okay. I, okay. <laughs> um, if anybody's ever interested, I can tell you, first of all, you are welcome to call me. I always give people my cell number in case people have questions. This is my email address. I will tell you, uh, email address is great if you want to send me pictures of a plant that has a problem or pictures to identify, but if you have a question or something, I might, I would much prefer to answer it on the phone um, because for me to sit at a desk and type all day is, is not in my chemistry and so I would much rather pick up the phone and have a quick conversation, get it done, hear back and forth from you. So that's my phone number um, there and email and then this is a fun little site. So if you go into your address bar, arizona.edu slash pubs, that's a U, you probably can't tell there. <clears throat> Um, what you'll come up with is a page, a page, and in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little search bar, and you can put in your topic. So this is a whole collection of all the articles and research projects that people have submitted over the years. So if you want to say, growing strawberries in Arizona, you'll pull up a nice article on, uh, from Tom de Gomez on growing strawberries. Um, cactus diseases, things like that. Just put in your topic and you can usually find about anything you want in there. And that's where this uh, longer publication came from. Oh yes, so the other, the other publication that you just got today called 10 Steps to Successful Vegetable Gardening. That is probably, I mean there are thousands of articles in this, but that, I think that's the number one most researched flyer in this entire website, is the 10 Steps. And what I really like about it, in the middle of that, you're welcome to look at it now, in the middle of that handout, there are charts. And it gives you charts on when to plant what vegetables according to your altitude. There are a couple of us that really want to do the, redo those charts. I find that my eyes skipping around because you've got, there's a 1,000 to 3,000 and there's a 3,000 to 40 and whatever it is, all over on the same page. Your eyes have to orient, kind of like you're reading a map, to figure out where you are. So our altitude is listed on there as 4,500 to 6,000. So I think Wachuca City is about the same as Sierra Vista, I think. Yes. So that's, that's the column you would look in. So you find that column that says um, 45 to 6,000, and then you can go to the vegetable you want to plant, and it'll give you the times. So my two complaints on this, this is, this is a very old publication, but it's been so successful that nobody's ever gone in to edit it. There are two of us that want to edit it. We want to do, um, put it in an easier format to read. And number two, we think that some of the ranges are a bit limiting. So if you've fallen a little bit outside of the range somehow where it says, oh, you can only do this February through April, read a little bit more. You might be able to push it a little bit later, that sort of thing. Don't limit yourself according to just those. This to me is a guideline. It's kind of like when you draw a plan for your living room and you want to buy new furniture and then you get the furniture there and you have to rearrange it eight times before it feels good. So this is a guideline only. Don't, you know, don't limit yourself. <clears throat> and then if you want to know what's going on with the Master Gardeners, because we will be having, we just had a workshop um, Wednesday. We had one last Saturday. Um, you can go onto our website. It's probably the easiest thing to do. There are two ways. So go to the website. I'm not going to give you the long e e email address or the long address because it's crazy. If you'll simply Google Cochise County Master Gardeners, not just Master Gardeners, you'll get every Master Gardener in the United States, but Cochise County Master Gardeners, it will take you straight to our website, and then you can go on to events up at the top of the page. And I try to keep it somewhat up to date. I'm not the best social media person in the world, but I try. I also try to keep our Facebook page up to date. Our Facebook page is also Cochise County Master Gardener. And then if you want to be on an email, like an event notification, um, did you all do, did you all do a sign up in here today? Yes. Okay. So did you ask for emails at all? Yes. Okay. If you, um, if there's anybody that does not want to be, or I may just take your emails, let's put it this way. And I put it on event notification so that you just get an email. And anytime you go, I don't want one more email in my life, just hit unsubscribe and we'll take you right off the list. That's probably the easiest than rather you guys going and trying to, um, adjust that list. We have some, um, some more workshops coming up. We just did one on, on birds, which was kind of fun. Last weekend, we did one on wildlife habitat, creating a habitat garden, which I thought was, it was one of my most fun ones to ever give because it gave you a goal of saying, 
maybe I want to be a certified habitat garden because the National Wildlife Federation offers you a certification with signage and all that and it gives you a checklist of all the things you can go through to be a certified habitat. And I hesitate to use the word, the term wildlife habitat because that doesn't mean you have to invite all the deer and javelina into your yard, okay? Mm -mm. But it does mean that you can provide for what creatures you want in there. You want lizards, and you want good insects, and you want the, uh, the dragonflies and the, and the spiders that you find, and all that sort of thing as well. And some of you may want squirrels, some of you may not. Some of you may want rabbits, some of you may not. But it gives you the things, it talks all about the, the food, and the shelter, and the water, and the sustainability and that sort of thing. And you can check off all these things and you can submit your garden and be a certified habitat garden, which I think was kind of fun. We think we're going to do that as an in-service for our Master Gardener group, um, July or August. And uh, may put that out on the website in case anybody wants to attend our meeting because our continuing education portion of our monthly meetings is always open to the public. So just letting you know what that's all about. Okay, let's, t which one? Oh, that is um, Google the National Wildlife Federation, and um, it'll tell you, it'll give you all the things you need, all of the points that you need to check, and then how many of each feature. Like you need two water features. You might need three features of shelter, but that all sounds complicated. It's really not, and you're going to be shocked, all of you, at how many all of these features you've already got in your garden, and that's what made it kind of fun to go through. So, all right. Containers, love containers. They allow you to, oh, and I, what, the other article that you have, I, that was another reason I was a little bit later than I wanted to be this morning. I thought of that, I wrote that article for the newspaper last year, and it just hit me that that might be some reading for you. Now, you don't have to pull it out now, you don't have to read it and all that now, um, but I just wanted to bring it so that you might be able to read it a little bit later. It's got a lot of little points in it. Okay, so in your containers, it allows you to not break your back digging in the soil, first thing. And I think that almost everybody, I, when I talked with Anne, Anne said that everybody's interested in growing in containers, but nobody wants to dig in the ground. And I get it. It's a lot of work. The only disadvantage that I can see to not digging in the ground and doing a ground garden is that there's a, there are a lot of natural microorganisms in the soil. And all of those microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi, a lot of them are beneficial. And um, like if you pinch some soil out of your yard, one pinch has more than a million microbes in it. And they're mycorrhizae, they're uh, beneficial bacteria, as I said, and fungi, and a lot of them create this wonderful environment. It's like a microbe environment that all kind of act together in producing the nitrogens and the environment that you want for good growing. So the only, that's to me the only advantage to not digging in the ground. Can you create a lot of that in your containers? Sure, if you use good soil and if you fertilize it properly, because people hear the word fertilizer and they think, I have to feed my plants. You are not feeding your plants, you're feeding the soil. Keep that in mind. You're feeding the soil so that those nutrients are available in the soil for your plants to take in. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna start by talking about soils because soil is the most important part of all of this. It's all about the soil. And then the second most important part of all this is watering properly. And I'm gonna hit that heavy too. Okay, so soils. Let me tell you about what your soils, what your soils are. This is, we're not gonna get heavy into science and we're not gonna belabor this a lot, but just so that you understand. So on one end of the continuum, you have sandy soil, okay? And on the other end of the continuum, you have clay. And some people will think that we have a lot of clay here because the soil is so hard, but it's not really clay, it's just very compacted. Okay, so what is sandy soil? Your soils are all made up of particles, particles and air pockets, particles and air pockets. So in sandy soil, the particles are bigger and irregular, okay? They're big and irregular. So what does that allow? It allows a lot of these little air pockets in here. So here's air pocket, like this. In a perfect soil, you have about half and half. 
because the particles are important, but so are the air pockets. Because what happens in there is that the water goes in and the water has to stay in there a little bit. The nutrients, it's just like taking Kool-Aid and the, the little sugars and dissolving it in the water. That's what happens. The nutrients dissolve themselves in the water and then that makes it available for the roots to come in here and drink that Kool-Aid and then it takes it up and then it takes it up into the plant. But then those air pockets have to empty. The water's got to be able to drain well. That's why drainage is so important. So the drainage goes out, leaving the air pockets because then the roots can take a breath. So breathing is just as important to them as it is to us. So they've got to drink and they've got to breathe. And that's why good drainage is so often very, very important. When you hear, you read about plants, it says make sure that it has well-drained soil. All right. Okay. Clay on the opposite end of the continuum is not made of big particles. It's made of little bitty slivers of particles like this. Okay. Little, and they're all packed very tightly together. And so that's what makes clay so hard to dig. So let's talk about the, and so somewhere in the middle is loam. And that's kind of what you're aiming for. So what's wrong with sandy soil? How many of you have gone out and watered and, the, and it's very compacted on the top and it just hits the top and then the water runs off? It doesn't soak in. Okay. But if you have sandy soil, you can hit the top of the water with your hose and the water will go into it fair, fairly easily. And then the water drains out of it fairly easily. So the advantage to sandy soil is you can get the water in pretty well and it will drain out pretty well. And it's also a little easier to dig, frankly. The disadvantage to sandy, if you think about the opposite end of this, the disadvantage is that it loses water more quickly. So it's not gonna stay wet as long. So you're gonna have to water more frequently. And then what else happens in sandy soil? If it's losing its water more frequently, it's also losing what more frequently? Nutrients. Nutri Ooh, you guys are good already. Nutrients. So you're gonna have to fertilize a little bit more frequently. Okay. Clay, on the other hand, packed so tightly, you try to get water into that, and many times the water's just gonna sit there and the clay just can't take it in because there just aren't air pockets. Little bitty, bitty slivers of air pockets in between. There's a little bit one here, a little bitty one here. But once you get the water in there, it holds it because it does not drain through that very quickly. So the advantage to clay is that it holds onto water a lot longer. Um, in fact, sometimes you gotta watch it because it might not drain. The disadvantage is it's really tough to get the water into it. So what can you add to, to sandy soil to increase its water holding capacity? Compost. compost, compost. Because what compost does is it gets in here and it fills in all these little spaces and it acts as a, it loves to hold the water for you but it also drains well. It'll add some nutrients into that sandy soil. So it really fixes a lot. What can you add to the clay to kind of open this up a little bit? Compost. Compost fixes everything. It's magic. Some people will look at the clay and say, but I'm just going to add sand to it. Well, you can add a little sand, and it will make it a little grittier and open it up a little bit, but the sand offers no nutritive value at all um, and sometimes will alter the texture of your soil. So if you can just add compost, and people will say, well, what, it, it, how many of you make your own compost here? And how many don't? Mm -hmm. And so I don't make mine yet. I, it's, it's, it's one more thing for me to try to do in my personal life that I just frankly don't have time to tend. And we don't do it in the Discovery Gardens, which is a real sad thing. But we stay so... Discovery Gardens, by the way, are, it, those are our uh, demonstration gardens over at the University of Arizona. Anybody in here ever been there? Okay, great. So that's our demonstration garden. It's the first one in Cochise County. And um, it's all developed and maintained by our wonderful volunteers. And so everybody stays so busy with that place that to ask them to do one more thing, let's add a compost pile we've got to maintain. We just, and plus we're a little shorter room. So, but there is a product. I bring this because people have asked me if I don't want to make my compost and I don't have access to, to um, aged steer manure or whatever, what do I do? I bring this because it's a wonderful product to tell you about. I don't push products. Master gardeners are not supposed to recommend brand names, etc. But I also feel that anytime I can give you a good hint, it's, a good, it's part of my job as well. So this is called Tanks. 
Tanks is the brand name. And Tanks is actually out of Tucson. And I was lucky, uh, they are uh, ex uh, exclusive at Ace Hardware, Ace Garden Place. And um, several years ago when Tanks first came out, Ace Hardware asked us in the Discovery Gardens to test this out, and so we did. Got to test some at home, and everybody really liked it. Um, we've now got people that order it by the truckload. They can deliver it by the truckload, or you can buy it by the bag. Um, it's gotten so popular that it's now used all over the Southwest. It's great because it's made out of all the local stuff here in the Southwest. They manufacture it right there. So what is compost? Compost is simply decomposed organic material. What do I mean by organic material? Organic simply means it's come either from plant or animal life. So they've taken clippings and all the stuff that, that, that they've collected. Um, and we don't even have to go into a talk. We don't, I mean, compost talk could be a whole thing. But compost is part green stuff, that's your nitrogen source, and part brown stuff, that's your carbon source. You got to get it in the right balance. But anyway, they take lots and lots of um, organic material and decompose it. And they monitor it. They monitor the temperature of their compost piles, just like, Sierra, like the Sierra Vista transfer station. Has anybody bought compost from the transfer station? OK, have you all liked it? I've always gotten decent results, decent reports on it. So now that you've got to go buy it, you've got to have a truck, or else you've got to be willing to go get buckets of it. Um, they do a good job of producing it. They do a good job of monitoring it there. They have to, uh, they keep records three to four times a day out at Sierra Vista to make sure that the internal temperatures of that pile are getting high enough that it's killing off pathogenic bacteria and virus and that sort of thing. It's also supposed to kill off a lot of the harmful weed seeds. So usually the Sierra Vista CD pro uh, product is quite good. And I have rarely heard anybody complain about it. Um, but if you don't want to go with a truck, oh, and it's, and it's very reasonable to buy, you can pull up with a pickup, and they'll fill your pickup truck for 15 bucks, unless the price has gone up during COVID. It's gone up to 25 Okay, yeah, COVID did. That's really cheap. That is really cheap. You got it. Very, if you have, so I know some people that put, will take a trash can or buckets and put it in there. Now, if you do that, then you have to shovel it yourself. But you can just do that, and they'll charge you just a few dollars per bucket. So that you can do as well. Yes, sir? We saw somebody rent a U-Haul uh, uh, trailer to take in there and get filled with compost. There you go. Well, there's, there's an idea. That's not very creative as well. So you can go there. It's very reasonable. Buying things in bags is always more expensive. But if this is easier for you to haul and take a bag and dump it, it's, it's reasonable for what you're getting. So I just wanted to tell you, you can go buy compost instead of having to make it or buy truckloads. OK. Oh, and it's, it's hot. I'm just going to throw some out here, and I'll clean this up. I'll put some out here so that you can kind of see the texture of it. It's got a wonderful, she's going, oh, the sweet job we're going to have. Yes, ma'am. But it does have a wonderful texture to it. It's been well decomposed. A compost that is not well decomposed will still have big chunks of bark and things in it. You don't want that. And, and this is true of anything you're going to do in container gardening. So whether you're planting something in a pot or in a big container, um, raised beds, that sort of thing, um, you don't want a product that is full of big chunks of bark. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, what percentage of compost to soil if you're starting a pot? Starting a pot or, the, or if you're a raised bed, like a raised bed. Okay, I'm going to go to all that when we talk about raised beds. But thank you. Don't let me forget. Thank you. So I will say this, though. This is the one place that it's not a great idea to save money. If you're starting a container garden and you want to grow vegetables in this pot, for instance, don't go buy the cheapest. I, this is a good old plastic one. I can throw it around. Yeah. Um, don't go buy the cheapest soil you can find because cheap soils are indeed going to have Cheap is a bad word, isn't it? Let's call it inexpensive. Okay, don't buy, you know how many times at the big box stores they'll have an old pallet out there and it'll say, today's special, this bag for a buck fifty. If you ever are able to pinch that open and look at the product, it's gonna have a lot of barky product materials in it rather than looking like a good soil product. All right, so why do you not want the barky? What's happening in our soils? Even in our, soil, even our soils out there, there's lots, there's always decomposition going. All those microbes we just talked about, they're always decomposing old roots, old in, uh, animal life like old worms, old insects. 
anything that gardeners have put in there over the years, whatever organic is in there, they're always decomposing it. And the end product of their decomposition is the nutrients that we're all after. What do these microbes need for their energy? Nitrogen. That's their fuel for doing all of this. So if you put in a product into a pot or into your raised bed or something that's got a lot of bark in it, those little organisms say, oh my gosh, look at all that stuff I have to decompose. There's all that new stuff that I've got to break down. So then they go work on that, and they'll work on decomposing all the, the bigger chunks of things, twigs and pieces and all that. And so they will, because they think that that's their priority, they will take the nitrogen from the soil, thus, if your plant is in here and it's planted in a pot of that less expensive soil, it's going to rob them. It's not going to produce enough nitrogen to be available for your plant. Um, I've, se I've seen people take, okay, so let's define something. Let's define, and you're going to have to just follow me. Tiki and Kent and Debbie know this. I will go all over the place because I always think of things I want you to know. So you kind of have to stay on the track with me, okay? But let's define these terms. Mulch versus soil amendment. Okay. A lot of people will use the term mulch to mean something that they add to the soil when they're preparing it. Let's use the term mulch as simply something that you top dress with. You plant something in your garden, and then you go top dress it. So you've planted, let's get some of this stuff off of here. Okay, here's your, here's your planting site. You've planted this wonderful tree, okay? And then down below here are its roots coming out. Okay, so when you do this, after you get this guy planted and you're gonna create your berm so that it holds the water, you wanna put a material in here to call, that's called top dressing. You can top dress it with compost. You can top dress it with the decorative gravel in your yard. You can top dress it with um, pine needles or old oak leaves or anything that top dresses about an inch on the top. Why, what does that mulch do when you're top dressing? And you're gonna do that in all your container gardening too. It's gonna, all kinds of things. I hear it all, and every one of you, every one of you is right. Yes. And so, and you're going to do that in your container gardening. Your pots, your raised beds, anything you do, once you get it all planted up, put a top dressing mulch on it of some sort. So that's going to keep the moisture in. It's going to suppress weed growth. That's number two. Number three, it's going to keep those roots cooler in the summer. And in your winter gardening, it's going to keep those roots warmer in the winter. So it's a, it's a great thing to do to top dress. So people will buy bags of mulch. How many of you have ever been to a nursery and they say, you need to, you're going to go plant this tree. Here's a bag of forest mulch. You need to add this to the hole when you're planting. And they want you to add like that bag plus two thirds of your native soil. If you look at the forest mulch or some of those things to add it to the soil, if you're adding it to your digging hole and all of a sudden you've got these big chunks in there because you've added it to your native soil, same process. Your organisms are going to be in there trying to break all that bark down. And uh, to take it a step further, sometimes when you go buy a bag of mulch at the nursery, uh, no, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to call it mulch. I want to call it bark. They'll call it decorative bark. Decorative bark that you put on the top of your plants in some people's gardens. They'll have a little note here that says added nitrogen. Added nitrogen on there. And they're, because they know and so you're going, why would they put nitrogen in this crazy bark decor decoration I'm going to put on my garden? Because they know that by adding all that bark to the top, that it's going to start stealing some of the nitrogen for your soil. So some of the better brands will add nitrogen to your decorative bark. Okay, which then makes me want to remind you that when you are planting trees and shrubs and perennials, you don't need to add any soil amendments. So soil amendment is something you add to the soil like adding compost or whatever you're going to add to the soil for whatever purpose. Um, soil amendments go in. If you're cr creating a vegetable bed, you need to add soil amendments to that soil so that it fluffs it up and makes it more nutritious for what you're going to plant in the ground. When you're planting something into the ground now, it used to be that they would tell you, don't, let me make, make, make the hole again. They used to say, you got to add soil amendment to this. Put a, a like I said, uh, a bag of this and two-thirds of your native soil. 
Well, about 25 years ago, somewhere in the last couple of decades, they've discovered that that is anti-productive. You don't want to add it. And it's, for those of you who've always added stuff to your soil, it's going to feel unnatural. It took me a long time to feel that way. Um, Master Gardeners did a project in 1995 over on Campus Drive behind Cal Ranch Supply. First, it, we planted, planted that whole median. And it was the first time I had ever planted something with no soil amendment. Those things took off. So why do you not want to put amendment in it? Because if you make all of this soil in this planting hole, like yummy, the roots go, oh, I'm loving this. And the first year, it will take off a little faster. It'll say, oh, I'm just loving this. This feels so great. You're going to get a little growth. And then they hit the side of the planting hole. And they go, wait, this is all slick. This is all hard stuff. And I don't want to leave home. I'm recognizing this as foreign. So what do they do? They just kind of start circling that hole. And they will girdle themselves. And so many times after many years, they first discovered this. I'm sorry, I'm going to tell the same story I've told before. But it's, it's several years ago in a big park up in Prescott, they had planted several honey locust trees there in one year. And within eight to nine years, all of those honey locust trees, one at a time, died. Couldn't figure out what was going on. They dug them all up, and this is what had happened. They had all grown out beautifully for the first you know, seven, eight years, and then begun to circle is what they had all done. So that was at that point that many of the universities did research to say, what if we just plant them in native soil? Make them learn to live in the environment in which they have to live permanently. And so the first year they may not take off quite as well, but they will, they will flourish and be healthy for much, much longer. Um, the other thing just to, that really helps when you're digging your planting hole, you know how when you put that shovel in and it slicks that hole, it makes it real slick? If you'll take your shovel and just make notches, Make little notches in the side. Just poke it. That gives little nooks and crannies for the roots to find their way instead of making it slick like a ceramic bowl. It helps them start penetrating that soil. Okay. So we know the difference between mulch and soil amendment. We're talking about soils for your containers, whether it's for pots, whether it's for raised beds. How many of you uh, garden in a galvanized trough? That's becoming quite popular. Have you got them out here too? No, we're going to, but we don't yet. Okay. All right, so since I brought it up, let me tell you about galvanized troughs. Because we started that in the Discovery Gardens with some troughs. You know, like the drinking troughs that, anybody not know what I'm talking about? You don't know, okay. Um, a, you, horse a horse trough, a water trough like a horse drinks from, or livestock. Say it again. What is the shape? I'll draw one. Okay, you can get them in different shapes and sizes, but basically, it'll look kind of like this on the ground. It's just, so one of them looks a little more like this. You can buy them in perfect circles. You can buy them long. You can buy them three foot tall. Um, but they're galvanized metal. You know, like, where's that cow? You gentlemen brought it in for me. What did you do with my cow? Here it is. Duh. This metal. That's called galvanized metal. And so um, you, at the ranch supply stores, like Tractor Supply and Cal and all those, um, they, yes, do you like my, you like my chicken? Um, we're going to talk about the chicken in a minute. Um, they, will sell all, they will sell troughs like this for livestock. That's primarily. And then several years ago, they became a popular thing in which to garden because you can make them have a country look. Or I've seen lots of businesses use them because they can also have a very industrial look and very contemporary look. Um, I visited a building at, um, in Lexington, Kentucky, and they had round galvanized troughs in rows to embrace a property line in front of an office building and they had it full of bamboo and it just looked very very industrial very very modern but it, oh there you go that it's a great idea yeah oh yeah i i love them i mean we I think they're i think they're cool so what did we do the first so what you have to do obviously what's the first thing i have to do with it with anything like that what's what's your biggest thing you've got to look for when you're developing a container for gardening. Drainage. drainage. <laughs> got to have drainage. You can't take an old boot and plant something in it and not put a hole in the sole of the boot. I mean, you go all over Pinterest and they've got old cowboy boots with succulents in them, but there's got to be a hole in the bottom. Old wheelbarrows, great little gardening. We did a whole crop of radishes and a whole crop of lettuce in an old wheelbarrow. It's really fun. Radishes, lettuces, those, all the greens, they don't need a big old long root system. And you can kind of wheel them around wherever you need them. It's getting a little too hot, too much sun, move the wheelbarrow more under a, under a tree, whatever. But make sure it has drainage. 
Yeah, make sure it has drainage. So when we uh, did our galvanized trough, the first thing we did was we put, let's see, what did we do here? Let's make this the bottom, okay. So we did a hole here and we kind of did this and did holes, okay. So I'm gonna tell you about what we did and which things did not work because the first year we failed in it and I'll explain why. Um, we set it on the ground. We had the holes dug in it. We then, uh, we then, anytime you do a pot of any kind, you wanna put something in the bottom to cover the hole so that when you're watering, it doesn't, rinse the hole, it doesn't rinse the soil out. Not cover it so that it doesn't drain, just cover it so that the uh, soil doesn't wash out. So while I'm on that topic, let me tell you the best things to do. The yes, easiest thing is to grab a rock that fits there. Rocks never fit perfectly. Just something to keep the soil in but still let the water out. My favorite thing to use is an old piece of screen. You having your screen doors replaced? Tell Ace or somebody, let me have my old screen back. I just bought a roll of screen for like $3, a whole roll of it. And so a screen's good on there. Some people will use coffee filters because they'll, the only problem is they will disintegrate after a while. You can use a piece of old pantyhose, something like that. Something that drains but holds the, the soil. Okay, so I had said, and it sounds like I'm going to be bad talking, and I'm not. I'm not. I had said, okay, we need to put something here like landscape fabric. Landscape fabric on top of this to keep the water from falling, uh, keep the water in, keep the dirt from falling out. One of the volunteers, this is several years ago, said, I know we have some old shade cloth. I said, oh, it's over in that tub. That's perfect. Why don't you put the shade cloth on the bottom, start with X, Y, Z, and I'll go get more soil because we need more soil. I never knew what happened. This volunteer, bless her heart, she's no longer with us. I mean, she's still living. She's just no longer with us. She, <laughs> she put, decided that if one layer was good, five layers would be better. And I didn't discover it until we started realizing that this thing was failing. Okay, so anyway, but one piece of shade cloth, one piece of landscape fabric, one piece of screen door screen, anything on there to hold the, hold the soil. Okay, then we decided that we would buy half less expensive soil and half expensive soil so that we could stretch it. So I, I talk a lot about ACE. Um, I, I'm not promoting them, but they always have products that we use. And Lowe's has good stuff, too. Um, so, we w so Ace carries one brand called Black Gold. Black Gold is a wonderful soil. It comes in uh, regular soil that's got some fertilizers in it. That has another one that's called Organic. It's got the, so the red one has synthetic fertilizer. The orange one has um, organic fertilizer in it, like um, earth castings and guano and that sort of thing. And then I bought bags of the less expensive ace potting soil and i thought i'm going to stretch it opening up the ace potting soil it did indeed have a lot of chunky bark things in it but we thought okay we're stretching it it's okay all right so we filled it all the way to the bottom with that and in the first year we discovered that everything we planted in here was turning yellow it wasn't doing well we finally dug it all out we, th so we looked at all the things that could have happened. So because this is metal, and this particular one in our gardens faces south, so that south sun is beating on that metal all day, maybe heating that up. So we dug everything out and discovered, first of all, discovered the five layers of shade cloth. Wrong. It was just a big, mushy mess at the bottom. You might ask me about, could we put stuff in there to, do, to displace the air? you know, take the space up. Um, I know that Pima County Master Gardeners did a great big dish garden, and they used a whole bunch of wadded up soda cans and put the soda cans at the bottom to take up space so they didn't have to use so much soil. Their thing failed. They dug it all out and, and figured out that all the soil had caught in between all those soda cans and had stayed wet and mushy, and it was just nothing but a big algae mess at the bottom. Okay? So I, I tell you about some of the mistakes that everybody makes. All right, so what did we do to change? Because we knew that it didn't drain. First thing we discovered is we had put this galvanized tub directly on the ground. Well, because of its weight, it kind of sunk into the ground a little bit. So even though we had holes in it, it wasn't draining. It was collecting underneath and not draining out. So the first thing we did was we had, we had some red bricks laying around. We got this thing up on red bricks. That was the first thing that helped. Now it's going to drain. 
So this all goes up on bricks. And so I think we put a little brick here and one down here and kind of like that. All right. And they looked nice. It didn't, it didn't affect it aesthetically. Then we said, while we're here, let's make these holes bigger and more plentiful. So we dug these a little bit larger. We made them larger, got a bigger drill bit, and then put, put some more down the middle just to make sure we were draining well. Then the next thing we did, instead of trying to displace this, we figured sometimes when you get soil that's so deep in a container, it, even though it dries up here, it never has a chance to dry out down here. So you will end up with a wetter mess down here, even when you're doing a great big pot. So we had somebody that had experimented, our county director at the time, had used a layer of straw at the bottom. It's nice, it drained well, but it didn't hold anything, it didn't collect anything. So we put five inches of straw down here. That was the second, that was the third thing we did differently. And that really worked to help drain it better and not collect a bunch of wet mush. Then, but before we started adding soil, we went and bought swamp cooler pads. You know what I mean by a swamp cooler pad? Anybody not know what a swamp cooler pad is? Okay, so in the swamp coolers, old swamp coolers, so, so many people are going to air conditioning, you might not know what a swamp cooler is, but in a swamp cooler, the system is you've got, you've got water that is blown, you've got, you've got little water, wait a minute, what am I doing? Inside the swamp cooler, you're running water. So watering water, it's on these little pads that are fibrous, it's like coconut fiber type thing, and then you blow through it. So when you blow through these pads, if these pads are full of water, and you blow through it, the water cools the air, and that's how a swamp cooler works. Okay, so we bought these pads. You can get them at any hardware store, and we put two of them here in the, we put them, we lined the front. They're only about this thick. I mean, they're not going to take up much room. So we stuck them here to keep the sun from beating on that south metal, and that cooled that whole south exposure. Did it help? I don't know. We like to think so. We thought it was so brilliant. So we wanted, yes, let's do this. All right. Then we added only good soil. We didn't add any inexpensive soil. We added good soil with compost and, um, and a high grade that we knew drained well and yet was very nutritious. And then we planted things in it. So what did we do in this? And this is an example of what you can do in your container garden. We tried to demonstrate to people, to our, to our visitors, that you can have an entire garden um, in one in one planter. So now we've got better drainage, only one layer of uh, so soil retention material. It's up off the ground so that it can drain properly. It's cooled in the front. We've used really good soil instead of anything bad. So now what we did, we've got our, got our trough. It's up on the bricks. Okay. So we started with, um, we wanted to say, well, you can grow fruit herbs, vegetables. So we stuck in a little dwarf peach tree. So the dwarf, anytime you plant something dwarf, dwarfs do beautifully in containers. Anything dwarf is always containerized easily because a dwarf plant's obviously going to have dwarf roots and it can stay little. And by the way, yes ma'am? Did you do all black gold? Yes, the second time. We didn't, yeah, we, yeah, we did not add any of the cheap soil because the cheap, so the cheap soils that we used the first time, there I go with that word cheap again, um, had big barky things in it. So we thought, okay, why is everything turning yellow? I didn't finish that sentence. Um, tiki's my spur here. Uh, thank you. Um, yellow because maybe it wasn't draining properly and also because we couldn't keep the nitrogen in it as well because it was being robbed because of all the decomposition going on from the barks in the soil. Okay, and so while I'm just telling you that, when you're buying things for and you want to do container, um, Anything labeled dwarf is always good. And also anything labeled nana, like a, a Nandina nana. Nana means dwarf. And another thing that, um, and anything labeled compact or compacta. So if it's labeled nana, compacta, or dwarf, they're wonderful things for containers because they don't need such, such root room. Okay, so we planted a dwarf peach tree in here. We planted, and over here we did a tomato. And then we did some herbs that came out the back. And then we maybe did some other herbs, like here's some chives. Um, maybe down here we put a pepper. And um, over here we did some pollinator plants. We'll talk about that. Pollinator plants are really important that you can add to your gardens, whether you put Put out one pot, make, a, make a, a collection of things. If you've got your pot of veggies and you want a little pot of this, 
Drawing pollinator plants, anything that provides nectar, you've got to have the pollination activity for your vegetables. Particularly important with things growing on vines. Um, tomatoes are more air pollinated, but um, many things are bee and um, hummingbird and butterfly pollinated and need the, and the nectar will draw them to your gardens. And so um, anyway, so I think down here, in fact, we still got this going crazy. Uh, we planted right here a small plant of bee balm and bee balm got so big it's now kind of coming out like this and it's dripping off the side and it's loaded with these beautiful purple flowers so not only is it a great pollinator plant but aesthetically it makes it very pretty too so anyway we were able to show that we could grow veggies herbs fruit all in one container that you don't have to have lots of space you don't have to have all complicated in-ground planting etc all right any questions on growing things in troughs like I said, learn from our mistakes and how we change things. The air cooling pads, did you put those on the outside or the inside? Oh, inside, so they don't show. We, t we just tucked them in here before we put the soil in and then put the soil right up against them. So did you put them on the bottom or all the way around? No, we just put them on, no, we didn't put them on the way, because the other side, so this is in the gardens, this is south, and the other side faces north, so we only tucked them in right here. Right here, inside, we didn't put them on the sides because these two things didn't get direct sun. And we, we don't need it on the bottom because the bottom don't get hot. And uh, the north side didn't get hot. So we just did it where the sun was beating it up so badly. How much sun exposure? That guy gets, when we first started it, it was full sun. Um, it, it, there's a mesquite tree that has since grown kind of over it, but it's still producing well. So you can do full sun, you, can do, you could even do part on that. But the, but the, the fruit tree is going to need at least six to eight hours of sun. Most vegetables, that's usually your rule of thumb, six to eight hours of sun. If you've got at least that, you're doing well. Yes, Sheila. To uh, have a, a dwarfed uh, peach tree or a tree or something in your, in your uh, water tank, how large is the trough tank do you need, stock tank do you need? The, the trough we've used is not even as wide as this table. It's about that size, I want to say. It's just a, I'm going to say, is it a? It's probably a two foot by four or two foot by six, something like that, yeah. Not a good estimator. Four feet? Tiki, would you, we'd those seen it too. You know what? Those a master gardener too, and I forgot to say that. I'm so used to seeing your face, I didn't pay attention. Uh, say, yeah, I want to say it's, oh yeah. I want to say that the trough we have is about the width, maybe, maybe a foot shorter than what this table is. The length. Yeah. And four feet's good because it didn't take up a lot of room. And then we added another smaller one by it and we put berries in it. So what we did in another trough, we wanted to grow berries. So we took a piece of cattle panel. Do you all know what cattle panel is? or hog wire or any of those things you buy at the farm store. And we stuck it on, we stuck it on the background. We just tucked it right in here along the back. So we tucked it here on the back, and it goes up like this along the back. Just cattle panel. Cattle panel or hog wire, you can buy little pieces of it, and it's not expensive. And then we just grew the berries right up it. So anyway, the, or, and you don't have to, and if you wanted to do um, vertical gardening, we'll talk about vertical gardening. How many of you do vertical? Yes, Ann? I wanted to say something about the galvanized I I garden in those, uh -huh. and I use the ones the horses have knocked the bottoms out of. Okay. So it has no bottom. Okay. And I just put it on the ground. I don't okay. have gophers there. I put it on the east side of my house, face it, the long going north south. That would make sense. So yeah. the only thing getting a lot of sun on the south is just the very short end. Oh, so I've head. never had overheating, but I put it about ten feet or twelve feet away from my house mm -hmm. on the east side. So it gets at least eight hours of sun. Mm -hmm. Then in the late afternoon when the, you know, it can get really hot, it doesn't get the direct sun. And it has worked beautifully. I be, that sounds like an ideal condition. Do you all, yes ma'am. And I'll, I want to go back to what Ann said in a second, yes. Do fig trees need pollinators? No, they're self-fertile. Okay, there's no food, haven't had food. Isn't it a little wasp? It's different. It's different. It's different for a fig tree they, because it's not a flower. Is it, a, is it inside the fruit? I think it's a little wasp because the, fig, the flower is inside the fig. The flower is inside the fruit on a fig tree. It's very different than your other ones. Huh? 
that's cool. Yeah, yeah. No, but no, it's not, no, it doesn't flower. Fig tree does not flower like other fruit trees do. Well, that I don't know. That, that would be maybe a water issue. They, don't want, they want to be watered regularly, and we're going to talk about proper watering, but they don't want to be waterlogged. Um, many things that produce fruit and flower, if they have so much water, they feel no need to reproduce because they don't have, they're not stressed. Um, so if it's waterlogged, it may, she may just be sitting there going, there's no need for me to produce kids. So anytime a plant's producing a flower, the flower produces a fruit, right? And what's inside the fruit? The seeds. Those are the offspring. So sometimes to get, you don't want to stress them by taking water back from them, but you also don't want to de-stress her so much that she feels no need to produce children. So check your water. I, do you water it a lot? Oh, aha! Okay. So check your soil. Your best soil, your, I know everybody buys the fancy little moisture meters and all. Your best moisture meter is your fingers or a, a long neck screwdriver, okay? So I would dig into it like the, the top couple three inches and see, is it still sopped? If you still got moisture in that top three or four inches, and this is true of all of your container gardening, um, don't water it. Let it dry out a little bit in the top, and I think maybe she needs to dry out a bit, maybe. Okay? And we're going to go back to that, too. The other thing you can do, even with things in the ground or things in a big container, you can um, get a big piece of rebar or a long-handled screwdriver, long-neck screwdriver, and just poke it slowly into the soil. And as long as it goes down easily, you know that that soil is still moist. When you hit this, you know that you've hit dry soil. And that's, a, that's the principle of a water probe that our WaterWise program sells. It's a big piece of rebar with a handle on it. And it, they call it their water probe. And you can test how far down your soil is moist. You can buy those containers without the bottom in them. The yes, you can. They, they I've can. seen them at Tractor oh, Supply, too. Yes. What, what so I we're going to talk about I, raised I beds. Get, I get quarter-inch mesh screening, uh -huh. and I line the bottom of the dirt. So they exactly, hardware cloth. exactly, it's called hardware cloth. So we're going to talk about that when we talk about raised beds. Don't ever build a raised bed directly on your ground uh, without a barrier between it and the soil. So maybe what, since you brought that up, maybe we'll go to raised beds next, okay? So how many of you have raised beds? Okay. How many of you want to do it and don't have them yet? All right. Hey, do any of you have raised beds that aren't working so well? Okay. What's one problem you're having with it? Just seems like nothing seems to grow. I have a bottle brush, a small bottle brush in that, and it's just not doing anything. Okay. And all the other plants that I've ever planted in there, they just die after a Okay. So we'll talk, when we talk about it, maybe you can identify what a problem might be. Okay. Anybody else have a comment on why you think your raised bed works well or doesn't work well? All right. So raised bed, Does anybody know what, what I'm talking about when I say raised beds? Anybody not know? Um, I, everybody hears me say this. My favorite answer is I don't know. Because if you knew everything, we wouldn't have to be here. So it's okay to say I don't know. I love that. Um, anyway, anybody not know what a raised bed is on the ground? Tell us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kent. Um, so you can build anything up on top of the ground to hold soil so that you are not digging in the soil. Um, the higher you build it, obviously, the less strain on your back. Um, but the higher you build it, the more soil you're gonna need to put in there. And there are all sorts of raised beds that you can do. So this is a semi-raised bed. We simply, this is in the Discovery Gardens, and we simply put bricks around this to um, border it. But it's not really got it raised up off the ground. Let me see if I can find, here's, now here's a raised bed in the Discovery Gardens. So a raised bed can be built with block, it can be built with stones. You can make dry stack stones. You can make it with um, wood. It's, um, I've seen people do it with pine planks. Well, pine will warp and disintegrate much faster than like cedar or redwood. I'm going to tell you about that. I've got a whole picture on that purple one too. Um, this is a wonderful raised bed, but uh, again, I'll tell you in a second. But so raised beds can be built out of many, many things so that you don't have to dig in the ground. So what you want to do though when you build your raised bed it's really, it, it's a smart thing to do to at least loosen the soil on the ground before you build it on there. Because if you have this packed ground and then you build a raised bed on top of it, sometimes that can create a soil interface. And what, what that means is one of two things can happen. Either this is so packed 
and so compacted that when you try to water it, this soil says, I can't even receive that water, and then it will pool and it won't drain well for you. Or the opposite can handle, it can happen. This can be so darn dry that what it does is it just keeps sucking up the water from your raised bed. But if you will loosen or, you know, just chop it, till it, shovel it, whatever you can do, the top two or three inches just so that it's loose so that when you put your new soil on the top, the soils can kind of marry up a little bit. Then you don't create that interface of foreign to foreign. It's kind of a gradual marriage of soils together. So that would be the first thing that would be really, really helpful. Second thing. Yes, ma'am. When I did mine, mm-hmm. I loosened down six inches, mm-hmm. but then I put a layer of good soil, and then I mixed it. So it's a gradual. Yeah. Very good. That's a great idea. Gradual marriage of the soils. Yes. Kind of weans it in a little bit. Then when you're, before you build on top, now you're going to put a layer. Now you want to put in a barrier to the gophers. How many of you deal with gophers? They're horrible. They're horrible, horrible, horrible. I know that God created every creature for a purpose. I cannot figure their purpose out yet. Trying to, trying to, just doesn't come to me. Soil aeration. Soil aeration. I know. (laughs) I know, but they aerate it by eating everything around them that's beneficial. So anyway, okay, for, does anybody have a bull, have you ever seen any bull snakes in your yards? Bull snakes? So what I, what I saw, because I've got gophers, and the other night we tracked a bull snake going through, and he just, he just went right over, and he went right down that hole, and I went, honey, go after it. You go after it. Yeah. So, Okay. But if you put um, a layer down here, you can use, as, as Kyle said, you can use, it's called a hardware cloth. It's like the metal hardware screen, and it's like a little quarter inch by quarter inch. And it's a little, um, if you're trying to bend it, it's a little harder to work with. I'd, everything I plant at my house, in the, when I dig a hole, I line it with a double layer of chicken wire. Now, some people will say, well, the gophers can chew through the chicken wire, but trying to line a hole with hardware cloth is hard for me. Plus, when I envision the hardware cloth being so tiny, I think, how are those roots going to go through that? And th- because that's too little for them. So I just use a double layer of chicken wire for everything there. So you can use chicken wire. You can use hardware cloth. You could use a couple layers of a landscape fabric even. Just anything to put a layer between the bottom of your raised bed and the ground. All right. This is just an example of um, what if we, we bought an old um, headboard. Bought a headboard here at a garage sale for $15 and stuck it in there and used it as a trellis. So we, um, we've grown all kinds of climbing things on that little headboard. It's just an old metal headboard. Kind of a fun idea. This is, in the, this is a raised bed in the Discovery Gardens. And this guy we built for wheelchair accessibility. Because everything's about demoing. We've got one whole section in our garden that shows people all the different ways they can vegetable garden. And so at first, this was a 10-inch piece of wood. I believe this is fur, I believe. And um, so we had a couple of people. We had an older person and a young person from the high school both test this in their wheelchairs. And they both said that this was, they couldn't quite reach the middle. This piece was a little too high. So we simply went in and cut this piece out and cut two inches off of it, which then enabled both of them to be able to reach the center. That's your goal. Get to the center of that bed. And we thought, well, that was meant to be anyway because it gave it more of an architectural interest, made it a little bit more fun looking. The other thing it did was because we cut it from 10 inches down to 8 inches, means we've now got 6 inches of soil in it because you don't ever want to fill any pot to the top. Don't ever fill any pot to the top. You've got to have a recess there so that when you put water in it, the water can sit there and then slowly penetrate in. If you've got your soil filled to the top of your pot, you're going to hit that, and the water doesn't have time to soak in. It's just going to run out. Okay. So the other thing it proved was all the things that we could grow in six inches of soil. Because people, oh, tomatoes need these great big tubs, and they've got to have three feet and blah, blah. We stuck some tomatoes in there, and they went crazy. We had lots of tomatoes. We even had squash. So here's a little squash. Pardon? It's six inches of soil. So squash did very well. Tomatoes did very well. Um, we, uh, pardon? All the herbs. All the herbs. We still got herbs even that never died out during COVID. So, we, so that's what we put in there. We had oregano and we had chives and we had parsleys and tomatoes and squash and peppers all in this one bed. And so we've had two nursing homes and five schools copy this, which really made us happy. The other thing we love about it 
is it's like working on a kitchen counter. There's no bending, there's no squatting, it's just really, really nice. It's easy to harvest and easy to, to tend to. So if I were going to, I would love to have a whole series of these at my house and not do any bending ever again. It would be <laughs> lovely. Okay. Okay. That just shows, that shows the tomato that was in there. It shows, I think that's a big basil that's right up here front and some squash that's growing all in that one little bed. All right, then here's another example of some short raised beds, but we also do vertical gardening in it. Vertical gardening is a really wonderful new thing, and I've got some more pictures on another program here, I'll show you in a minute. But vertically, you can do so many things vertically. So if all you have is a, if all you have is a deck, off of your condo or your apartment or your mobile home, all you have is a deck, you can grow so many things vertically. You could do a pot like this or even put a trough on the back that doesn't take up much room and stick some trellises into the back of the trough or the pot and up these you can grow cucumbers and squash and, and melons can grow up very, very beautifully. And even the things that are producing the heavier fruit, and I'll show you a few pictures of that in a second, as they grow up, all you have to do is just is, is support them. I've seen people use the, that green garden tie tape. I've seen people take women's pantyhose and cut them in little strips because they're soft and they don't, they don't cut into the stems and just tie the stems up little, and plus the fact the pantyhose don't show behind the leaves um, and then as your as your fruit begins to develop now the cucumbers and and the cucumbers aren't quite so heavy but when you do some of the bigger squashes or some of the bigger melons you can still grow those up and then as they begin to develop you can take like a little bandana or another piece of stocking and make a little hammock for them some people call them melon bras We've talked, I've seen, I've seen it that way. And you just take a couple of S hooks. So you've got a little S hook and a little S hook and you make a little hammock for it. And you put that melon or squash in there so that um, the weight doesn't break the vines. Um, it's very, very successful. Uh, do you, I've seen pictures where there are tomatoes, butternut squash, cucumbers, all of it on one trellis. Pole and you, beans. pardon me? Pole beans. pole beans, that would be another great idea. Pole beans and pumpkin. yes, and peas. Pumpkin. Now, pumpkins, you need a big, heavy bandana. But, yeah, but that would be okay. That would be, that would be fun. That would be a lot of fun. Sweet peas. Sweet peas. Oh, sweet. Sweet peas would be beautiful on there. The fragrance and the pollination, and they would climb in and amongst all of your vegetables. So you can do vertical gardening and produce food with almost no space. Now, what are you going to have to pay a little more attention to if you do all that in one pot? Water and fertilizing. You're going to have to make, because you're going to have a lot more root in there, and they're going to be taking up those nutrients that are mm -hmm. dissolved into the water. So you want to make sure that your watering stays regular. Um, it means you're going to, you want to water, th so I think we're going to go to water, well, we're going to go to watering next, but you want to water them regularly. Don't let them dry out, but don't keep them waterlogged, and then fertilize them a little more frequently. And when you fertilize, though, well, we'll talk about this. I want to keep doubling back. Fertilize, you want to make the, dil the dilutions a little bit less. If you've got a pot and everything is contained in it, you don't want to make a big old strong batch of fertilizer and put it on there because that fertilizer has no place to disseminate out and weaken itself. All that fertilizer goes right on top of those roots and can burn. So we, we will mention that again here in just a minute. There's a, a pig fence, which you can buy in any hardware store works just... The pig fence, the hog, yeah. Oh. So hog wire that, that Kyle's talking about, hog wire, he calls it pig fence, I call it hog wire, either one. So that's the one that's got the, what is it, about two by two, two by or three by three. And then the bigger one, which is about four by four, is called cattle panels, if you're looking for it. Uh, you can buy great, well, and I've got a picture of that here in, in a... Dan, I use just field fencing kind of like that and field posts inside there you the go. garden. And everything just, the buying things just right in the road. And field fences. Right it's very inexpensive and effective. Yeah. And so Debbie just attaches, attaches, it, attaches it to T-posts. Yes, yes. Very and good. Move along the way, though, too, because it'll, it, the weight sometimes, because I have the sugar pumpkins. Or, oh, I yeah. I support them. With, I mean, like with your pantyhose bra or whatever. Yeah. But they, they do fine. They good. Them, they attach with the little tendrils. They do. Some of yeah. them will attach like that, yes. Now, you can't explain to an old man's spring mattress. The oh, I've seen that on Pinterest, yes. Yeah. Did you hear what she said? 
took the springs out of an old mattress and stood it up. And it gives wonderful places to crawl. That is clever. And it would be fun to, to look at, too. It's different. It's different. You could even spray paint it a fun color if you wanted. Yeah, that would be cool. Yes, Anne. We're using concrete reinforcement wire uh -huh. as our vertical, and, and you buy it in 50 roll rolls because we use feet of it, many feet. And we have 32 foot long beds and we uh -huh. put it in there with the fence posts. We also make arches. So the pole beans go up on the arch and go over the top. Yes. So do the peas, the uh -huh. sweet peas you were talking about, they go up over the top. It's unbelievable. So I have well, a picture this is real of easy to bend. So yeah. we've got women our, my age doing this, and we can handle that wire. Yes. With some of those cattle panels and stuff are a little bit. Well, they have to be cut in order to handle them. And yes. I have a picture of cattle panel going from bed to bed here in just a minute. Yeah. That's. I mean, those are all wonderful ideas. You can. There's no limit to your creativity when you're yeah. doing gardening in containers. Ever is ever. Concrete reinforcement wire coated. No. Oh, it's just wire. It doesn't have. Any. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions before we move on? Yes. I'm just visualizing the wonderful art they made out here in the garden out of branches. Oh, yes. You're talking about this one. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. And that you could do something with branches, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can try to make it rounded, or you can just do this and this, and you can grow all kinds of things up a, a homemade arch or a homemade arbor. Trellis, or also you can make homemade trellises out of branches. You know, and just kind of string them together with old jute rope or something would be fun. Yes, a little different. Um, and my, do you have any suggestions? I live in Whetstone, and my area is lacking honeybees. Last, honey bees last lack, two years. Yeah, two years. It's and so I plant the veggies, and of course I don't get any. Yeah. So she's lacking honeybees. Oh. Okay. Well, so do, have you, do you have pollinator plants? Do you have plants Pardon that, me? do you have pollinator plants in your garden? Like salvias and things that produce nectar? I have flowers. Flowers. flowers, okay. So when you're doing, um, it, to have a pollinator garden, so we're on a little bit different topic, but that's okay. It's important. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna be doing veggies, it's wonderful to have pollinator plants in your garden that will draw in the hummingbirds and the butterflies, and the moths, and the bees, and all of that. Because without them, you can plant all the things you want, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna mature. Um, I know, I'm sorry for redundancy because people have heard this story, but I do think that the, that the bee population in America is getting better. I think for a while, it was really starting to decrease because of the herbicide use and the destruction of the lands um, because of all the concrete going in. There are not as many wildflowers that produce the nectar and such. And, and the air quality. And I think things are getting better. I've noticed at my place, the bee population has steadily gotten better the last three or four years. In China, the air quality has gotten so bad that in many places where they're trying to produce fruit, they can't, they don't have enough bees to, po to pollinate anything and they're not getting any fruit production. So they are paying women to crawl up ladders with paintbrushes and go from flower to flower to pollinate those things uh, in order to get the pollen in there to get the fruit production to go. So. Thank a bee next time you see them. Don't be afraid of bees. I know that that's a big thing. Oh, I don't want bees on my property. The only time a bee is aggressive is if you disturb a hive. So if you've got a hive that's developed in a knot hole or under an old tire or in a culvert or something, and you happen to go by and threaten that hive somehow, what is their entire goal in life? Their goal in that hive is to, produce, is to protect that queen. So if she sees you as a threat to the queen, then they're gonna, then all those worker bees are gonna come after you. And that's, but that's the only time they're gonna be aggressive. Do bees have to have water? Yes. Oh yeah, yes. absolutely. So if you put in water fountains, mm -hmm. water fountains, bird fountains, whatever. She might need to put a water. A water source, mm -hmm. yeah. water source would be good. A bird bath, anything bird like bath. that. A bowl with marbles in it or rocks in it so that they have a place to land while they drink. In fact, in the, in the um, habitat garden, that's one of the things that we talk about. So if you've got a bird bath at home, if you put small rocks and large rocks, first of all, it gives the birds a place to land so they don't drown. Because sometimes they can't drink from the rim of the bird bath that fall in. And mm -hmm. So if you put a couple of rocks in the, in the middle, mm -hmm. and then a few in the middle, um, bees and butterflies and all those guys can drink from it. Um, Sand also works for butterflies. 
Uh, sand in a bowl, you mean? Sand. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, so plant, so plant plants that, so anytime you've, so hummingbirds, butterflies are drawn to color. They're drawn to color and butter, uh, hummingbirds love things that are tubular shaped. All of the salvias, you can't plant enough salvias. There's so many species of them and they do so many colors and forms. Uh, my favorite happens to be salvia gregii. Yeah. It's, very, it's common, it's always easy to buy and that crazy plant will start blooming at the end of February and not stop until the next frost. Excuse me. You have to, salvia gregii. So it has, it has common names. Many people call it red salvia or they'll call it autumn sage or they'll call it red sage. Sage is the common name for salvia. And that's why common names are difficult because you'll have so many common names for the same plant. You'll also have all sorts of different plants that share the same common name. Yeah. I can write anything you want me to write on the board, just tell me. I'd be glad to do that too. A lot of people think of pollinator plants when they think of penstemon. And penstemon's lovely. And it does, to me, it's one of the first trumpets of spring because all the penstemons bloom early, all that pink stuff that blooms along the highway and Buffalo Soldier Trail, if you all ever go up into Sierra Vista. Um, that's the native penstemon perii, pen, uh, peris penstemon. But the only thing about penstemon is it blooms for a while. It's lovely when it's blooming, and then it's done. And many of them just kind of fade away. They sort of rot off. And then you have to depend on them to throw seeds to kind of repopulate. Where the, where the salvias... They just keep on going. Some of them, many of them are perennials. They'll come back year after year. Some of the salvias, you have to read the tag. Some of them are annuals and that you will have to replant them, but they'll throw seeds. Many of the, um, many of the salvias are woody. That means they keep their structure all year. Woody. What's the opposite of woody? Master Gardener people in here? It's the opposite of woody when it melts to the ground. That's called herbaceous. So you have a woody plant that keeps its form, and then you have herbaceous, which means it melts to the ground, but then comes back after the winter. So um, salvias come in all forms. This is a little form of a salvia, okay? That, that serves. Another thing that serves in a pollinator garden is for butterflies. So things that are large and flat that have multiple florets, because a butterfly can't hover in the air like a hummingbird can. So this gives them a place to land and then feast on all the multiple florets. So this whole thing is a flower. All the little parts of it are called the florets. And the, every one of them has a buffet of nectar in it. Which one is this? Yeah. This is actually a kind of an annual called pentas, P-E-N-T-A-S, pentas. You can find it in pink. I just saw Lowe's got it in in dark red. I've seen it in whites and bright reds at Ace. Um, they love it. They'll even take a hot sun, but they want to be watered pretty regularly. Is that an it's, it is promoted as an annual, yes. Um, I've got a couple that were in pots that actually came back on my patio this year, but they were protected. So treat it as an annual, and if it comes back, it's a bonus. It's a bonus. Do you all? So there is a, so what Tiki's saying, the verbenas are wonderful. They have a long, do everybody know what a verbena looks like? It's kind of a ground cover. Looks a lot like lantana. Lantana and verbena are very similar. Um, but verbenas require deadheading to keep them looking good, where lantanas don't even require deadheading. However, verbenas will come back sooner in the spring. If you want a long blooming verbena, there's a native one called Gooding's verbena. Verbena Goodingi. And um, it's native. You'll see it along the highways. And Gooding is spelled kind of oddly. Oh, oh, it's with two Ds. Gooding's verbena. And we planted three of those in the very first year we ever did the Discovery Gardens. And those Gooding's verbena bloomed three years in a row, even all through December and January, without ever stopping one time. Now, they're a bit short-lived. They sort of pooped out after three years. But my goodness, wouldn't you? You know? <laughs> and they do reseed. And then the other one that's native that reseeds like crazy is the moss or rock verbena, which is another little purple verbena. I have rock on my property, rock verbena, mm -hmm. and I will dig it up and put it in a pot yeah. with other things. It does really, really well. It does, rocks. it sure does, and it's beautiful. And in case anybody's reading in a catalog about verbena and you can't find it, some crazy committee got together and changed its name. It's not called verbena anymore. It's called glandularia. 
Who would name a beautiful plant that? So it's like glandularia gooding eye instead of verbena gooding eye. I still call it verbena because verbena, it's a beautiful word, and glandularia is medical. Yes? Are they all the attractors to answer the question? Oh, butterfly. sure. Mm -hmm. Bees, butterflies, mo moths are very important pollinators as well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I've got those. Yes. If you plant curly parsley, the black tails all the will lay their eggs on it. Oh, okay. Yes, and we've got, um, I have a little picture of that too. So we've talked about the importance of the soil. Let me talk just briefly about water, just quickly before we go on. Okay. The biggest single mistake people make when they move here or when they have gardens is that they don't water thoroughly. Just like I heard this young lady over here say, well, I water it every day. Do you know how many people think that they're doing good things by watering every day a little bit? I'm going to water it a little bit, just give it a little drink every day so it never gets thirsty. Huge mistake. You've, the first thing you've got to do is whatever plant you have, you've got to water it thoroughly so that the whole root ball gets wet. That's your number one. It takes approximately one gallon of water to saturate about one cubic foot of soil. So if you're planting a new little one gallon plant that, you know, you got a root ball about this size, you want to wet that area, it needs one, a good one gallon of water. If, you, if you're planting, say, a new five gallon size tree, if you know what I'm talking about in, in, those, in the plant sizes. Okay, let's look at this guy. This, I think they call this a two or three gallon now. So I'm going to look at this. And I want a margin of soil around it wet because roots, dry, roots grow into wet soil, not dry soil. So I want this whole margin. So what do I have here? I have at least two cubic feet there that I want. So this guy needs at least two gallons of water, maybe a little bit more. You always want to water thoroughly. Always. If you only water a little bit, you're only, it's, it's like you guys being so very thirsty and I take half of this cup and give you that much water when you've come in from a long walk, and I say, here, this has got to satisfy you. That barely wets your mouth. You swallow that, that barely satisfies your thirst, and it certainly doesn't rehydrate the cells in your body. But if I give you a full, good drink of water, you can drink that glass down, it satisfies you, it quenches the thirst, it kind of rehydrates your organs and your cells, and you can go a little bit longer before you have to come in for another drink of water. Plants are the same way. If you're container gardening, is it a good rule of thumb to water enough and see water come out the bottom? Sure, sure. And we're going to talk about saucers. Because some, pe some people use saucers. Then you've got water in the saucer, which could be good and bad. Okay, we'll go to that. Um, but the ladies, uh, but, but the people that will say, I water a little bit every day, what are they doing? How deep is that water penetrating? A couple inches? Try it. The next time you think you're watering deeply by hand, dig into it and see how far down that water went. You're going to shock yourself that you're only going to find it's penetrated about this way. And, and the top two to three inches of your soil is absolutely the most stressful place for the plant's roots. That's the hottest. It's where all the salts have concentrated, all the salts over the years of watering and fertilizing and whatever goes on. It's... Um, and so you don't want to keep the and, the, and then the roots just stay there in that very stressful zone because they never know when they're going to get their next drink. So they're right there at the top trying to catch any bit of rain or water that they're going to get. It, so a good rule of thumb that has been put out by the university, if you look at a watering chart, they will say that for perennials, little, you know, like little perennials that are established, these guys, um, water to one foot deep. Shrubs, established shrubs, water to two feet deep. Frequencies a minute. I'll be right there. With, who said that? Oh, okay, I'll be right there. Um, I thought that was you. I'm sorry. Um, so perennials one foot deep, shrubs two foot deep, and established three trees three feet deep. And you say three feet for an established tree. That's not that deep when you think about the trees. The majority of trees keep the majority of their roots in the top three feet of soil. They go out laterally so that they can collect the rain, but they want to be in this area. And why do they most of them stay in the top three feet? Water accessibility, plus it's more aerated. Remember we talked about air in the soil? The deeper you go, the less air there is. So it's that top three feet is important. And what else am I going to tell you about trees? Who wants to say it? Don't water the tree at the trunk. The trunk is not where you're it's taking up the water. And I'm coming back to frequency, I promise. I promise. Okay, so 
Here's your ground, here's your beautiful tree, and here are its roots for now. As the tree grows, you've got this canopy, its crown goes out to here. How far out are those roots? The roots mirror how far out that canopy is. So the roots will be out as far as that, and sometimes even half again as far. So, however, so that's called the drip line. Drip line means you, you imagine where the rain is falling off the edge of the tree, okay? And wherever that is, you draw a, uh, an imaginary line around it, that's called the drip line. The roots that are at that drip line, set, more than 70% of the water is taken up at the end of those roots. Picture those roots out here and picture the fact that that's where all the little root hairs are. As you go back to the trunk, the root hairs disappear. This is now all hardened off and become a mature piece of wood. Your root hairs are clear out here. And imagine that all their little drinking mouths are out here. So if you've got one of those cute little trees that you put in here years ago and you made this little rock, this cute little rock border around the bottom, everybody's still watering in that in this, as that tree grows, those roots are clear out here. Watering here doesn't matter at all anymore. It's out here. So you want to, whether you're hand watering, you, then you want to make a berm so that you can um, water there, or whether you're moving your drip irrigation. So when the roots go out like that, and then you see this little starter over here, is it possible that that starter is part of the little, part of the root? Oh, it depends on the root, sure. If it's the same tree, then it, it depends on what the tree is, but some of them will put out new ones. Some trees do that. Some don't, some do. Oh, the, you mean the little starter out here? I don't know. But that's a sad thing. Um, yeah, just try chopping it. Sometimes the more times you cut something, like it, with weeds, the more times you cut them, they'll finally give up and say, I don't have any more energy to come back again. Okay, don't. They just come back with the Yeah, they do. But the weeds? No. The oh, this tree thing? What, what is the tree? It's like a. Tree of Heaven. The cancer tree? It's like a formless mesquite. Like a chili. I don't know if it's chili mesquite, but it's like a formless mesquite. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, they're gone. They, they're, okay. Yeah, they're, they've gone from. Okay, well, this, I don't know what to tell you right now. We can talk about it offline. We can talk about it in a minute. Oh, it's just got to think you just keep chopping it because if you, if you poison it and it's connected, you'll probably poison the rest. Yeah. But, okay, and then I'll answer your question. You talk, so I didn't mean to skip you and go on, but um, you want to know how frequently. That's going to depend on your type of soil. So everybody's yard, everybody's ground is going to hold on to moisture a different rate as the next guy's. If your soil is twice as sandy as your neighbor's soil, you're going to have to water sooner. So the only thing you can do is get, learn the cycle of your soil and how quickly it dries out. Many people will have drip systems. How many in here have drip system? It is, if you, if you ever have the opportunity to convert to a drip irrigation system, you will see so much difference in your plants. Your landscape, everything. I could go on for another 30 minutes on the advantages of drip. I used to hand water everything I did. I finally tried segments of it in my yard after hand watering for 15 years. I tried drip irrigation and I couldn't believe the difference it made. It is huge. Huge in the, qual in the performance of the plant, huge in your time savings, and huge in your water usage. Your water bill will be cut way down or your well usage, whichever you're on, if you're doing a drip irrigation. What about container frequency? Hang on, so, okay, so, so you are gonna need to just check your soil, and even if you're on a timer, and it's set to go every three days or whatever, if we've had a huge wind event, for instance, your soil's gonna dry out faster. Check the soil, you may need to turn it on or water extra. If, it's, if, if we've had a huge bunch of rain, you might check the soil. Don't trust the rain. Just because we have a downpour, go out sometime and see how far down that penetrated, especially in the beginning of the season. Sometimes you're lucky to get an inch saturation. So check it with your fingers, check it with a moisture meter. As soon as you kind of figure out how, long, how deep it's gone and how quickly it dries out, so as soon as it dries out two or three inches, it's time to water it again. And then you'll know that during the summer, I may need to do these young guys every two days. During the winter, I may need to only do this every once a week or every 10 days. And don't forget to keep watering in the winter. Got to water in the winter as well, okay? Just, just less frequently. 
those, there's still transpiration going on with all the evergreen plants that keep their leaves, and you don't want the roots, even, for, even if it's deciduous, you don't want the roots to desiccate and dry out. Okay, Tiki wants to know about watering containers. It's the same thing. When you water a container, you want to water it all the way to the bottom. Um, if you can see it come out the bottom, that's great, but you water it all the way to the bottom, and then don't water it again until the top couple inches begin to dry. Let's talk about saucers real quick. Some people love saucers. Um, if you do have them, though, and, and, you, and it drains out, then you need to be pretty astute about w emptying them. Because what happens when the water just sits in the saucer? Two things. You're gonna, so it's just gonna, it, it doesn't allow those roots to dry out. Now you're going to get a little bit of rotting in the bacteria. And mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, yes, yes. So remember that mosquitoes love stagnant water, not moving water. So if you have a pond or a water fountain that moves, you're okay. Who likes the moving fountain to lay their eggs? Dragonflies. They're great little creatures, and they love, they love moving water. So like in the Discovery Gardens, we have a little habitat pond. We have a little waterfall that we turn on quite frequently to make sure that that water moves. Um, but mosquitoes need 72 hours of stagnant water. Now, and then a little quick message about saucers. If you're going to buy saucers, um, make sure they fit your pot. This is just an aesthetic thing for the way it looks. So fit, fit it. So if I want to put this in here, see his shoes are too tight, okay? Right? It's just, it just doesn't look good. And if I put him in here, his shoes, it's okay. This one's okay because it sort of matches this. But if you're going to have a bigger saucer, make sure that it's straight in the, in the saucer. This is a silly thing that I say. There's not, it's like if this thing looks like this and you come over to my house and you go, well, that doesn't look very tended to, do you see how much neater and cleaner and tended it looks if I make sure that this is centered? So that, that's just a little tip. Um, I don't know if this one fits it any better. This is not a usual pot that I bring, but that's, it's okay, but this one almost might look better. Let me tell you quickly about the difference in the clays since I have them right here. When you're choosing clay pots, I tend to love clay because clay is porous. I'm panicking because I'm running out of time and I have so much I want to show you. Um, the, uh, there are different clays. The, the smooth one is called an Italian clay, so it's, made, it's got a less sand content to it where this is a Mexican clay. Mexican clays are fun because they're, they're festive and they've got decorations and all, but they have a higher sand content. You can feel it. So they will disintegrate faster than the, than the Italian clays. Um, but clay is porous. It breathes. Do you ever see the white salts collect on the outside of clay? That's a good thing. It's drawing the concentrated salts from your water and from your fertilizers out. If you like the look of that, because some people think it's rustic, great. If you don't like the looks of it, you can just brush it off with your hand or a little toothbrush or something, and the white will come off of it. Okay. What about pebbles in the uh, tray? You so can, the if, you, if you can do that, you can put pebbles in the tray. That's a great idea for even house plants. So because a lot of people have house plants, they'll put pebbles or glass pieces in the bottom of the saucer, and then uh, you leave a little bit of water in it so that the t bottom of the pot is not touching the water, but it provides a little bit of humidity. So it's a great thing for house plants and outdoor plants during the, during the dry season. I want to touch on pest and disease, and since I have this here, I'm going to talk to you quickly before I go back to pictures about fertilizer, just really fast. Fertilizers, can, if you want to do organic, a great one is fi fish fertilizer. A great one is bat guano. We use a lot of fish emulsion in the Discovery Gardens. It smells like a lake, but only for about six hours, and then, the f and then it dissipates. The nitrogen content is low, so it doesn't burn, but, it seems to, but it's enough, and it's, it's in a format that the, the, that the plants can take it up quite well. Um, it re and it works quickly. We can get good results from fish fertilizer if we see something that's just a little bit pale. Oh, we could go into the whole thing about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. I could tell you all of that. I mean, I'll stay here as long as you want, but I do want to cover the, and I can answer questions after so that those of you who want to go can do so. Question? I was just going to say the fish fertilizer, can you put that in the sprayer? Yeah, you could, sure. Um, usually what we, we have the watering cans, and we take about two capfuls. We don't measure it exactly, throw it in a two-gallon watering can. You could probably do it in a sprayer as well. Um, you've got all kinds of organic things. Uh, bat guano, you have sea kelp, you have blood meal that is nitrogen, you have bone meal that is phosphorus, there are lots of organics. And for instance, I'm not pushing ACE, but they have them all in one nice section um, in their fertilizer aisle, I can't remember, is that aisle two, can't remember. Um, but you can, Evan or any of those guys can show them to you and you can look at them, they're very much fun to look at. I want a quickie word on miracle Grow. 
Um, for people that are growing things, so, so containers allow you to do lots of things that you ordinarily couldn't do in our ground. You all know that our, our soils are very alkaline. And see, I could, I could do another five minute talk on the alkalinity of our soils, and what does that mean? Um, we are alkaline, unlike most other areas in the country. Most other areas of the country are acid. So how many of you came from a place where it said, they said, add lime to your soil when you plant? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Lime is very alkaline. You don't want to add lime here. You want to add something that acidifies, like sulfur or peat moss or compost, um, aged manures, any of those organic things will help acidify your soil. Um, you don't want to add fireplace ashes here like you do in other parts of the country. Lots of people add that to their gardens. But fireplace ash is indeed quite alkaline. So that just adds to your problem. So some people, though, want to grow things that require a lot of acid, like blueberries. If you're going to grow blueberry, it's got to be put in a pot where you can control its soil. Um, flowering things like gardenias, azaleas, camellias, some of those acid lovers. So miracle Grow has this thing called mere acid that helps you acidify the plants. I bring both boxes because I happen to have both boxes at home. A few years ago, they were trying to explain to people through marketing what their mere acid product was. So they changed its name and then called it miracle Grow for azaleas, camellias, and rhododendrons because those are the acid lovers, thinking they were teaching people that those are the plants you use them on. Everybody that knew mere acid said, where did my mere acid go? And I'm not growing some of these things. Why do I want this? So they figured out that they totally confused the public and changed the name back to mere acid. <laughs> so it has all the good phosphorus and the good nitrogen and everything. In fact, I've got one guy in Tucson that uses this explicitly because it's got a great balance of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all the micro elements, plus a little bit of an acidifier, which all of our plants can use. It doesn't hurt any of our plants. Miracle but has the organic it does have it. It is good stuff, and it doesn't have near the potential to burn either. The, the organics don't nearly have the potential to burn. But a caution if you're going to use Miracle, so the regular Miracle Grow box, I didn't bring one in, is green and yellow, green and gold. I think most of you recognize it. So let me give you a caution on your Miracle Grow fertilizers because they are so heavily used. On the Miracle Grow box, it will give you these directions for how to dilute it. It will say one tablespoon per gallon of water. And it will say for outdoor plants. And then it will say one teaspoon of miracle Grow per gallon for indoor plants. OK? This is three times as concentrated as a teaspoon, OK? If you take a container plant, just because it's outside, and put this strong dilution on it, you've got a lot more uh, potential to burn it. Because you're stake, taking a strong dilution that they're saying put on your outdoor plants that you put in the ground, it kind of disseminates through the ground, it gets washed with the rain, it yada yada, and, and so that's okay. But what this should say is one teaspoon per gallon for anything in the ground. And then this should say for anything in a container understand the difference so if anything in a container I'll cover it's your house plant or something outdoors it's in your raised beds it's in your pot by your front door do it do, dilute it by three only do a teaspoon per gallon and that way you're not nearly going to have the potential to burn so it's like about 100 square feet for like that one tablespoon yeah like 100 square feet of it's a lot I agree it's a lot of lot of material that is a very strong dilution I agree with you and I think it's very poor directions on their packaging. And they're also very high in salt. Yes. That's the other thing I was going to tell you. They're very high in chlorine. So miracle Grow has got a high chlorine content, which is a high salty content, and which... It doesn't come out of your soil very easily. Mm -mm. Salts don't move. Salt it, it, it stays. And that's sometimes... That's, that's the white thing, the white precipitation, for lack of a better word, that you'll see out on the sides of your clay is the fertilizer salts, like the chlorines in your miracle grows. Or you'll even, like in Wilcox, the salts are so heavily in their soils that you'll even see it up on top of the ground. Okay, oh, I could go, I could go on about fertilizers a long time. I could tell you about the NPK. What do, with, what do the three numbers mean on the front of a package? You know, when you look at the three numbers, what does all that mean? But I feel like I'm keeping you, and I want to show you a few pests. Also, read real quick that you shouldn't spray fish fertilizer. Well, now that's a good thing to know. That I had not heard. I've only seen that for fish. 
Okay, so he's saying don't do not put fish emulsion in a sprayer because he read somewhere that that can indeed burn the leaves. You know, some people will take fertilizer and spray the leaves. That's called foliar feeding. F O L I A R it means they they take it in through their leaves and then send it down to the roots. So, but Kyle's saying you read don't do that with fish. Okay. Anything else on fertilizers? I'm telling you, I could go on on fertilizers a lot. All right. It is always better to do less than more. It is never better to do more fertilizer than what the package says. So let that, if I can make that point, you know that old line about never say never, never say always? Never do more than what the package says. How yes? How often uh, did you fertilize a pot of plant? I think in the strong heat, like in the strong heat of June, I probably wouldn't make it eat right then. But once the spring, so, so like for instance, okay, so if you've got, if you've got potted trees, Rule of thumb for potted trees, like for fruit trees and that sort of thing, so I'll take it into the pots too. They want to be fertilized three times a year, sort of um, in the early spring before the buds break, and then in the middle of the summer when the soils are beginning to kind of wash out of all the nitrogen, and then again in the uh, mid-fall, because it's that mid-fall fertilizer that's being stored in the roots, and it's that energy that's going to push out the spring growth. So about three times a year. If you're doing things, if you're doing like flowers and things in the pots, I usually try to say, I mean, there's some things that'll tell you every couple weeks, every three weeks, but if I can do it once a month, I'm happy. I just don't, I try not to do it in the heat of June. It's just too much. But once the rains come and cool off the soils a little bit and we get some real honest to golly moisture in the soil, then I'll usually resume it in Ju July and fertilize July, August, September, and then mid-October, you want to stop your fertilizing because you now don't want to push new growth because the new, the new growth is going to be tender. So, and then, so you want to stop, rule of thumb, stop six weeks before your first freeze because all that stuff's just going to get freeze burned and damage the plant. What about lantana? I've got a lot of lantana. I know you do. Um, I would, you can, lantana comes in late, so I'd wait until you get some leaves on it or you're just putting fertilizer on a dormant plant. I would wait until May when you start to see the leaves, and then you can fertilize lantana up until about the middle of October because it'll get nailed with that first freeze. I do it once a month. I mean, good rule of thumb. It's easy to remember. Okay. Easy to remember. You don't. You know, there's no hard rule. Yes, Tiki. Uh, we didn't talk about slow release like osmocote. I know. I'm telling you, I can talk to you all about. In fact, I was going to show you the osmocote in this soil. I know. I can't. I can't get to everything. Okay, let me see. And I'm going to go to pests in a minute because Tiki brought up Osmocote. Um, wait a minute, did I see another hand? You, sir? I, I was literally just going to ask about the Osmocote. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so let me, let me address it real quick because it is, and there, so rule, another rule of thumb, when you first plant something, you've got it in a pot, you've got it in the ground, you don't want to put fertilizer on it when you plant it. How many times people plant a tomato and instantly make up miracle Grow and pour it on there? Mm-mm, mm-mm. You want to wait and a couple, either wait a couple of weeks, that let it let it take its break, let it get its breath back, or wait till you see the first signs of new growth. I can't tell you. Years ago, when I had my garden center, I would have people buy a perfectly good tomato, and they would come back a week later, and it would all be burned, and I, they'd say it's dead. I want my money back. Well, well, I fertilized it and everything. What did you do? Well, I put I put. Some people even take the blue miracle Grow granules and put it right in the soil. That's really strong. And so I would say to them, don't fertilize it when you first plant it. You've just burned it. It'll come back. But sometimes it won't. Sometimes it's burned to death. The only exception to that is a product called Osmocote. Osmocote. And then uh, Jackson Perkins has the, essentially, if you buy your roses through Jackson Perkins, they produce a product called Once, and Home Depot has a product called Vigoro. It's pretty much all the same stuff. Osmocote was the first in the industry, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But it's little pellets, and they're about the size of about a, a third of the size of a green pea, and they're covered with a resin on the outside that is porous. So the fertilizer's in all these little pellets, and then it slow releases through the resin coating. So it's not a quick application onto the roots. It's not a quick, and it doesn't have a potential to burn because it is so slow release. Some of your, many of your soils will have these type fertilizers in them. Of course, this one I can't see it in here. How many of you have ever bought a, a, a plant at the nursery? You take it out to plant it, and you see these little round pellets, and they're either beige 
and translucent. Sometimes they're green and that's good, but sometimes they're beige and translucent and you instantly think it's a fish egg or it's, a, it's an insect egg or something. Uh -uh, it's just the fertilizer pellets that the grower used when they planted up the plant. So don't let that scare you. So that is Osmocote, it works well. You can buy two forms of Osmocote. One is a four month last, one is a nine month last. And um, one is for fruits and vegetables, one's for flowers and green shrubs, and either one of them will work just fine. They're not that different in their composition. Okay. Um, I'm gonna throw this out in 30 seconds because if we're talking about fertilizers, you gotta know this. So when you look at your fertilizers, you know, anybody ever read and go, the NPK ratio for your plant? So the, all your numbers, so if you buy a fertilizer that says 20, 10, 5, what do those numbers mean? First one is always nitrogen. The second one is always phosphorus. P stands for phosphorus. N stands for nitrogen. The third one is always iron. What's the symbol for iron? Anybody know? Fe. Fe. F -E. No, no. That's not right. The third, the third one is always potassium. What's the symbol for potassium? K. I don't know what I was thinking. I wanted you to know that Fe does indeed stand for iron because when you're reading things, it'll talk about the NPK ratio, or it will say Fe deficiency, and you're going, what's an Fe deficiency? It's just iron. That's all that is. Okay. Nitrogen makes green leaf. Phosphorus makes root and bloom. And potassium is just for general overall cellular health. In our soils, we don't nor normally have to worry about the potassium. Phosphorus is um, somewhat limited, but not terribly. But, it get, but phosphorus does not move through the soil well, so you have to really kind of work it in. Nitrogen and iron. These are the two that are of most concern in our soils, not so much because they're so depleted, but also because they get chemically bound up in our alkaline soils. So yes, we need to continually add nitrogen and iron, but if, you've, if you know that there's plenty of nitrogen and iron there and things are still turning yellow, then it, you could try to acidify that soil a little bit because when you can lower that pH and make it more acid, chemically it gets released. These two will get released. So what do you use? A good thing to use is sulfur or compost. Or I hate to recommend peat moss because peat moss is becoming a concern, but peat moss is indeed pretty acidic. Okay, so that's just a quickie chemistry lesson. Oh, I'm telling you, we could do a two hours on fertilizers. Okay, you want to go straight to anything else on containers real quick before we go to pests? What are we going to talk? Oh, and if you're going to plant a pot, here's a big tip. Plant a pot, plant a big pot, whatever. You're going to, maybe you're going to do up five pots today, and you're going to empty your soil and get working with it. Always pre-wet the soil. It will help you so much. Pour out your potting soil into a big wheelbarrow or something if you're going to do multiples, or put your soil in one pot, but wet the soil first and kind of knead it around so that it's, it's got the consistency so that when you open your hand, it sort of sticks together, but sort of falls apart. If you put your hand together and it's all gloppy and it sticks, it's too wet. But if it doesn't hold together at all, it's still dry. So just water it, knead it, because once you, if you try to plant your plant in a dry soil, have you ever noticed that you go to water it and it all poofs out the sides? It just, it, you can't ever get it wet again properly. Plus the fact you've got air pockets in it. So if I could tell you one thing, you know, what do I think the most important parts about containers? Drainage, pre-wet the soil, don't over fertilize. Do leave at least a one to two inch margin at the top. Don't plant your soil to the top. What else would be important on a container? What's your opinion on ceramic? I think ceramic pots are beautiful and they're fine. They look nice. They, look nice. they, don't, breathe they don't breathe as well, so you just need to make sure that they're draining well and make sure that they don't get real soppy at the bottom. Um, plastic pots are okay, they're a little bit less expensive and they're much easier to move around, but they do dry out in the sun and they'll begin to crack and chip. And you know, and so everybody, everything's got its advantages. I think the ceramic is, a, I mean, I grow lots of things in the ceramic. Pardon? They're pretty. They are pretty, they are pretty. And, and um, I feel like, well, there's ceramic underneath. No, the ceramic's not letting them breathe, but I still think they're better than plastic. I mean, the ceramic's better than plastic, I think. Okay, let me go to some pests real quick. And if you think, I'm, I'm glad to stay as long as you all want me to. I can stay after I'll, um, for any more questions on any of this. Let me just go to a couple of these things. More vertical gardening in the gardens. Oh, vertical gardening, tipsy pots, 
fun way to grow things on it. You got one little space. This is just one round bowl with a big piece of rebar stuck in the middle. We took these pots and then just tipped them back and forth, and each one has a different flower or different herb in it. Fun little way. It's a good accent in the yard and takes up no space. Another great vertical garden idea, we bought an old ladder for 10 bucks, painted it, and put pots all over it. And they'll, they'll, all those pots are full of different kinds of mint. So just ideas. Those could be mints. Those could be herbs. There's a close-up of a vertical ladder garden. Uh, more vertical gardening. This is out of control. This is what happened during COVID. We <laughs> lost control of all kinds of things. Those are berries. Horizontal garden. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Showing tomatoes growing up. That took no space out. It was all upward. Took no space. Vertical gardens. Oh, there's a picture of a melon on the, on the upward. Just an idea for another vertical garden. You can buy those spice racks all day long, line those, hang them, and, and you can see all the fun herbs and lettuces they planted in that. That takes no space. There's a picture of what you were talking about with the two raised beds and then one piece of cattle panel back and forth. So it's, it's not only very efficient. And see, think of all the things that could be planted in here. Peppers and oh, all sorts of things. You could even plant a squash in the corner and let it kind of spread out and over. That doesn't have to be just vertical there. There's a picture of the troughs. That's Marianne Capehart. Yeah. So you picture, look at all the things put in one. That's a trough, by the way. That's a water trough. Okay. Um, shows you all the things that are growing in that one trough. What's the normal depth on those troughs? One of the gals asked. The, the Different. 24, you get yeah. about two feet. Okay. 24 inches or 18 inches is probably the, the best. Yeah. Otherwise, they weigh a ton. They weigh a ton, and you can't move them. It's, I know. We let, I think the one we bought was too deep. So we bought one that was like three feet tall, and you don't need it that tall. Hmm? I had heard years ago about packing peanuts in containers, and then I heard, no, that's a bad thing. Because it's the same concept as the um, crushed up tin cans. Okay. So yeah. It gets I think it gets together. nasty. Yeah. Um, so here's, here's an example of a couple of things. A nice big pot. You want to grow a tomato in a pot? You know, you've got your tomato. Let me do this real quick. All right, let me do this. I'm going to use this little guy. He's not particularly a pretty pot, but he's small right now so that we can demonstrate. So, um, but I could do... Sorry, Chicky. I tend to want to, I, I love people that express their personalities in the gardens. There's nothing wrong with planting up a great big pot and sticking something fun in it, whether it's yard art or whatever. Another fun thing to stick in your pots is um, solar lights. I have pots of geraniums going up my front porch. Up my, I have about seven steps up to my front door. It's all geraniums in, order of, in honor of my grandma. And then I have a solar light in each pot. Solar lights are becoming so affordable, so it shows them off and it lights the way at night. I don't have to have extra lights on. It's, you can do that with a sidewalk. You can do a cluster of pots at your front door and put solar lights in them. Lots of things to do with solar. Um, and when you're doing your tomato, yes, you can buy those cages, but don't hesitate to put something fun in there. Maybe you want to do like a fun trellis that you would ordinarily do for a fancy vine, but you can do it for a tomato. These little fancy trellises usually aren't too much more money than buying the cages. And he's going to stay crooked for a second. And then you can add, let's pretend this is a marigold. I couldn't find a marigold in this town. I've been shopping for marigolds. Marigolds are fabulous with tomatoes, so pretend he's a marigold. I sh this reminds me here, companion planting. So marigolds are great because the smell of the flower helps repel pests, helps repel a lot of the aphids. They don't like the smell. But even more than that, a lot of people don't know that the roots of a marigold um, repel root knot nematodes in the soil. And root knot nematodes, which are these little microscopic worms that attack roots of tomatoes quite frequently, um, will they, and they will bring the tomato down, so they will repel those inside the soil. Did you have a question, ma'am? No? You, okay, I thought maybe you were, okay. Um, another thing that is a wonderful companion plant for tomatoes is a basil. Basils pretty much do the same thing. Um, they will, aphids and some of the other piercing, sucking mouth part insects like white flies, spider mites, aphids, that sort of thing, do not like the smell of basil. So in this pot, I've got a tomato. I can now stick in a little basil as a companion plant and stick that in there with them. I've also, there are also people, that's yeah, sinking. 
I'm not going to do that, am I? Anyway, I've also heard people say that they believe that planting basil with a tomato enhances the tomato flavor as well. So that's another good one. You could also do a, a pretty, do another herb. Do something that spreads out, that falls over the edge. So if I come this way, I've got a flower for repelling. I've got basil for another cooking herb, and then something pretty that will spill out over this is a thyme. This happens to be a lemon thyme, uh, my very favorite herb, by the way. If I only had one herb, it would be that one. It's delicious, it cooks well, and it's a beautiful plant as well. So you can do that. And then if you've got it in a big pot like this one, you could do the tomato with a nice big trellis. You can do your flowers. You can do more herbs. I also in I don't think I brought in my chives. But ch oh, chives are kind of fun because it's another texture. Am I going to push that off? Anyway, you can see the texture. You can add, and then you could probably add in a big pot like that. You could probably add a pepper if you would like. So you can do all sorts of things in there. But I, this is to show you that you can do trellises and pots. And don't forget your marigolds. Okay. All right. Number one pest in your garden, aphid. Anybody never seen an aphid? So everybody knows aphids, right? Okay, so let me tell you about aphids. Most of the time, you can control them quite well by, by strong shoots of water. You can go and spray them with a strong squirt of water, and most of them are too lazy to crawl back up if you can get them off of there. They have weak back legs. They're kind of lazy in nature. They'll just kind of go on. But you will always have survivors of your first, your first uh, treatment. But let me talk about the layers of treatment. So layer number, level number one would be strong squirts of water. Number two would be good old Dawn dish soap in a quart of water. Spray them with soap, soapy water, about a teaspoon in a quart. Why? Because aphids produce honeydew. Have you ever seen the white, the, the, I'm not white, it's clear, the clear substance that's all over the leaves. Um, you'll see it on trees. You'll see it on vegetables. It looks like somebody took Cairo light syrup and put it on the leaves. It's kind of, it can be sticky. That's called honeydew, and that is the byproduct of aphids. It does a couple of things. It um, is their byproduct, but the second thing is, is it, it, they, it protects their little bodies. So if you use the soap, it strips them of the honeydew, and um, it dries them out, plus they have these little gill-type breathing apparatus, and it kind, of, it kind of clogs them, and they don't breathe well with all that soap in their breathing parts. So the other thing about aphids is that they are 99% female, and they are self-fertile. They, they don't need a male to have a party, and they will just keep producing live young. And so that's the other problem is that, see, she's just spitting out live young like crazy, okay? You know, and, and here's her new little troop. She just keeps eating stuff and piercing those tissues of the plants and sucking the tissues dry while she's still giving birth. So what happens is anybody that is still surviving from your first treatment, they're going to mass produce and repopulate within two weeks. So when you've got aphids, you need to treat them about every three or four days to break that cycle. So don't treat them once and think you're done. But if you can stay after it for three or four treatments, they're very easy to control. Okay. This is a piece of broccoli. Anybody ever picked a piece of broccoli in the winter? And you put it in your mouth, and you haven't looked at it for aphids? Can you see the aphids on that? It happened to me one time. I was so proud of my broccoli in the winter garden, and I picked it on my way out to feed the horses and got a mouthful of extra protein. Mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So, okay, these are white flies. White flies are a, a, another little pest in the garden. You'll often find them on the backside. So that's another thing. It, here, be preventive. You know, there's a whole thing called integrated pest management about managing your pests. One of the concepts is don't plant the same thing over and over again. You know, spread them out. You know, don't have 18 tomatoes here and 20 tomatoes here. I mean, uh, and 20 peppers here. Kind of mix and match because that's called biodiversity. If you do monoculture, one same thing, one pest finds it, then they've got a whole buffet of everything they love. But if you kind of spread them out and mix and match them a little bit, it confuses the pests and they, they kind of will go on. A second thing is look at your garden every day. Look at those squash. Look at your... Always just, just check them. And big thing, always check the back of the leaf. That's where you're going to find the little larva. Larva is a term that means the immature form of the, of the adult. You're going to find the little immature forms. I'll show you pictures in a second. And you're going to find eggs. Look for a singular egg or look for clusters, but you're going to find your eggs on the back. And if you find them, just squish them. 
Just squish them. It, it's a lot easier just to stand there and squish them than it is to go, go to the store, spend money, buy something, come home, prepare it, spray it, do. Find them, just squish them and get rid of them. I like what you taught us about aphids being lazy. They are lazy. If you knock them off, good. Yep, you can, it's very easy. Oh, and I didn't go to the level three. Level one was spraying them. Level two is soapy water. Level three, you can buy organic insecticidal soaps to spray. Insecticidal soaps have pyrethrins in them. Pyrethrin is a, um, um, a material that's extra- extracted from chrysanthemum. And so it's organic. It doesn't affect your pets or you. I have heard, though, that insecticidal soaps can affect beneficial insects. So you just have to be careful. If you just keep it on the keep it on the plant that you're attacking, especially your vegetables, and hopefully your your beneficials aren't going to find it. But anyway, these are white fly, and you can see how they're on the back of that leaf. Again, on the back, and all the little these are all the little lesions that they've created by piercing that tissue. Okay, this is spider mite. Spider mite is um, more common than you think. People just don't recognize it. So spider mite is um, little teeny weeny weeny sp- spiders that you barely can even see, and they create this very fine webbing. And like, for instance, on junipers or trees or some of the shrubs, you'll see something that looks sort of rusty or something sort of brownish, and you get up to it, and if you get real, real close, you can see how fine that webbing is. You can see the webbing, or you can take the back of a leaf and rub it, and the webbing will come off on your finger. On, um, if you suspect it on shrubs, trees, or whatever, you can take, let's say that this is a brown piece, and I think, is there, are there spider mites in this? I can take a piece of white paper, and I can tap it like this, and I can look at the white paper and let my eyes rest on it for a minute, and all of a sudden, I might see little bitty black spots beginning to move around. And so then that's, you know, that, that would be the spider mites. Those guys you want to attack, and you want to attack them quickly. For how little they are, they can take a whole, a whole cypress or a big juniper down in no time. So spider mites. What do spider mites love? Three things. Hot, dry, dusty. Hot, dry, dusty. So beautiful plants that you like. It's a good thing to spray them off when it's June especially and everything's so dusty and dry. Get rid of the dust. That's where they like to breed. I also think that if you can spray the dust off of plants, it opens up. There are little holes on the leaves called stomata. That's where they breathe. That's where all the transpiration happens. I feel like it opens that up. They can breathe better if their leaves are clean. So, spider mites. Oh, anybody grow grapes? If you ever see a grape, a, a leaf that has all of a sudden turned to kind of a lacy thing. You still have the veins. You still have a clear material, but all the green tissue's been eaten out of it. You turn over the back, and you can find these are the little larval forms of the grape leaf skeletonizer. So the adult is a little moth, but those are the guys that do all the damage. They get in there and eat all the tissue. We, we found those on a grapevine we had in the gardens, and we simply just took a plastic baggie, and we just kind of pulled them off, put them in the baggie, and put the baggie in the trash, and it's a lot easier than trying to spray and have all that done. We had it cleaned up in five minutes. There's your picture. She knows what that is. So this is parsley, and parsley and dill are the plants needed for the larval form of the black swallowtail. And so that's, they look somewhat similar to monarch caterpillars. So this is the larval form of the black swallowtail. And you say, yes, it's going to eat that parsley down. Go ahead and let it. It's going to eat the parsley. It's going to move on. It's going to form its chrysalis. And then it's going to turn into, whoops, wrong arrow, turn into that. And that's your black swallowtail. And oddly and wonderfully, that parsley has now been naturally pruned. You'll have a whole new parsley plant within 10 days or so. It'll all come back. And dill's the same way. She it. mentioned curly, curly parsley. parsley. Curly parsley, flat leaf. The, yeah, they like the part. Okay. It, 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 it eats both. This is your flat leaf parsley. This is the one preferred by your culinary people, your chef type people. They say it's more flavorful. The curly parsley is beautiful. It's, it, you can cook with it just fine. It makes beautiful garnish as well. This one is not quite as um, bitter, for what, lack of a better word. Okay, y'all see what the problem is here? Cutter bees. See the little holes? Okay. That is not a disease. That's not a problem. It is not a damage. It looks like a damage to you, but this is, this is created by the wonderful little bee called the leaf cutter bee. She is the single most efficient pollinator bee in the desert. Way better than our honey bees, way better than our native bees. Um, she, she's, well, I've got a picture of her. So she gets in there. 
And in about five to 12 seconds, she's a mm, it takes that little piece out and then simply goes and builds her little egg nest with it. And new leaves will come right behind it. Don't worry, I can't believe how many people think they need to spray to kill for these bees. And it, first of all, she's already taken the piece out and she's already gone to build her nest. This whole phenomenon will be over in a couple of weeks. Let it be, no, no pun intended. And you're, gonna, and you're gonna have all new leaves soon and there's no damage to this plant. She's not hurting it at all. You know, aphids and some of those guys can, it, when they pierce and suck, that's, that's what their category is. It's called a piercing, sucking mouth part. They will introduce virus and other diseases. These guys don't cause any problem like that. Squash bugs, if you've got squash, many times you'll see these. Go out and just look for them. You'll see them along the canes or you'll see them underneath. Just, we've had, we've had an infestation of these at one point and we just took plastic bags out and picked them. Pick them, just pick them off and squash them. You'll get them, you'll get rid of them much faster than trying to do sprays. The whole thing is about preventive examination. Look at your gardens every day. And then squash bug, let me see. The squash vine borer, has anybody ever had that problem? You've got the whole vine, you know, and the, the, th the vine comes out and all of a sudden this whole thing is dead here and you can cut into that vine and see the larval form. You'll see a little, a little worm right in that vine and it's already eaten through the marrow of that vine. Once it's done that, there's no saving this part of the vine. So you can try cutting off the dead part, cut off the part that's got the larva in it and see if you can save the rest of the plant, but there's no there's nothing you can do about it at that point. I keep using the wrong arrow. Okay, there, here, are, this is squash vine, squash bug eggs. Perfect representation. That color and how she lays them in little clusters. Again, you're gonna see them sometimes on the front of a leaf, but oftentimes on the back. Okay, we had these in the gardens about, well, the year before COVID. We had no squash bugs, but we got these. And what did we first see? We saw that the, that the vine leaves where all of a sudden they were turning brown, they were getting eaten, um, they were getting lacy looking. We turned on the back and saw the larval form of this. We saw this guy, all these little yellow things. Here's a better picture now. So this is the life cycle of the Mexican bean beetle. So she ends up looking like a ladybug, either, a, either um, this color that I just showed you, a yellow or kind of a rusty, but it won't be the bright red like a ladybug. But this is her life cycle. So these are her eggs. So we found the eggs, and then we found larval forms that looked like these guys. They looked like little yellow bed slippers of some sort. And so it, we made it almost a game. We would get to the gardens in the morning, and we'd say, how many of these can we pick off in five minutes? And we get little plastic bags, and what have we done in five minutes? Well, we've got enough for today, and we just take them and throw them in the trash. Don't add any of this stuff to your compost. Not worth it. Don't, don't do that. Okay. Everybody know the tomato hornworm? Okay. That's something that you're going to see the signs many times before you see the hornworm. You're going to walk out and that's going to be gone. Let's see, let's get a tomato here. Me too. So all of a sudden you walk out and this whole piece of the plant, the, the leaves are gone, but the stems are all there. Leaves are gone, but the stems are there. And then you look down in the base of the garden and you'll see these hornworm tomato frasses. They look big, kind of cubicle shaped. They look like little pieces of black charcoal. And the minute you see those black things in your, under your tomatoes, you probably know it's just good old tomato, uh, hornworm poop and start looking in the tomato. Sometimes they're hard to see. And I can't ever look at the stems. I have to kind of let my eye rest and just go out of focus and then they will show up. Another fun way to find them, anybody know? Black lights. Black lights. Take a black light at night because they fluoresce with a black light like a, like a scorpion does. So you can do that in the evening for something fun to do. Hornworm, sh hornworm hunting. Hey, Jan, last year on my Chitalpa, uh -huh. I had huge, big green guys like that all Ooh. over the tree. And I just picked them off. Just pick them off. Now, now, are they hornworms? Um, it depends. Well, any, the, anything that's got a little horn on the horn is, called, is tagged a hornworm. So like there's a tobacco hornworm. Okay. There's a pepper hornworm. Tomato hornworms are the most frequent. So it, it, they could be in the hornworm family if they've got a little, a little horn on them. I don't know. But let me tell you, while we're on caterpillars, well, wait a minute, I'm going to go to caterpillars. Um, caterpillars are next. Okay, so let me show you this. They like beer too. 
They like oh, beer. If you want yeah. a little cup of beer to trap them. And, and, and go in that drain. Yes, and exactly. Right. So little little can like you could take canned jar lids or and things like pot, that. You know, little, pot thing, little, little what? Saucer, little saucer. You like the, something shallow. So you can do tuna cans. You can do. They'll crawl in. They'll if don't make it too tall because they can't crawl in. But something shallow, fill it with beer, and yes, you can drown them because they really are attracted. Okay, this is a picture of, if you ever see this phenomenon, this is a good thing. There's a, a parasitic wasp that lays her eggs in the hornworm, and the larva of the developing eggs eats the hornworm and kills her. So that's what that phenomenon is, and it's not that uncommon to find that. And that is the sphinx moth. Everybody calls this the um, hummingbird moth. That's the adult form of this. So the hornworm is the larval form, just like caterpillars all turn into moths or butterflies of some sort. This particular caterpillar turns into the sphinx moth. So when I find them, I say, do I want it to develop into a sphinx moth? Do I throw it out in a field? If I'm feeling good and generous, yes. If not, I'll feed it to my chickens. It just depends on what... what chicken, it's the chicken and the egg. I don't know. Oh, well, the sphinx moth laid its egg. The, but, but moths and butterflies are the adult forms of caterpillars. So, yeah. So she's laid her eggs, and it's developed, and the egg develops into the um, larval form. So this is the, it, like the teenage form. And then it... They just, they just show up. They're this big. Fresh. I know. You didn't see them in there. So the, they go from a, an egg to a pupa, to a larva. And the pupa is usually sort of tiny, and you don't really see those very much, it's going from the egg to the pupa. Then the larva gets big, the larval form. Um, OK, this is cutworm damage. That you, go, you, go out, you got your new plantings, and you find a little grub. What are the what are, grubs are the larval form of, anybody know? Beetles. Yes, beetles. So some grubs are the form, and, and there are lots of different grubs. Some of them are the larval form of the little brown coffee bean beetles. You all know the green June bug, the shiny metallic one that some of us from the Midwest used to tie a string on their legs and whirl them around like a helicopter. Yeah. So, what the, uh, so the June bug go, goes into the soil, lays her eggs, and then the grubs in the soil, then it develops into this larval form. They eat roots and things in this, and then they develop into the adult, and then the adult flies out of the soil only to start her life cycle again. This particular, how do you kill them? Um, they're given to the, oh, you mean in the soil? If you've got them in the soil, if you've only got one or two, you're okay. I've always heard if you've got like a square foot and you, you can count more than 20 in a square foot, then you have an infestation. Then you should put some sort of a chemical on there. Or, I'm not going to recommend it because I don't know. My expertise is not in chemical warfare. I'm just not good at it. It's, um, I trail real hard not to use it. Pardon me? Oh, anyway. So, so, so when I dig them up, like if I'm digging a hole and I find them, I just grab them and um, I take them either to the chickens or I just squish them, either one or the other. Um, but if you've got cutworms, so this is one form of a grub, you'll have damage like that where the uh, plant has simply fallen over because it cuts it off at the surface. And what am I doing? And I've always heard, okay, I can do this. I don't have my glasses and I keep hitting the wrong arrow. So you see it literally will cut it off at the base. Um, some people, when, they, when they're doing massive seedlings, will do little cut paper cups around them and give this a collar so that the grub worms can't get up to the plant. Second thing you can try to do is take eggshells, crushed eggshells. Don't powder them, but crushed eggshells. Put them around there because it will cut the bodies of these grub worms. So the, like eggshells, it's kind of like the same principle. How many people use diatomaceous earth? Okay, it's, diatomaceous earth is the same kind of concept. That's, diatomaceous earth is crushed up, ground up, um, diatomes from the ocean, like crustaceans. So it's all slivered little diatome shells, excuse me, and, um, and, it, sli and it cuts soft-bodied insects, is why people use that why as a... Why would it kill its host that fast? That doesn't make any sense. Why would what kill its host? Why would the cutworm kill its host? Oh, because it, it, it ate it. I don't know. This doesn't it's make sense. Crazy. Well, I, I, they don't have degrees in anything that oh. I know of. <laughs> I just don't know. It, doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. Okay, here's another phenomenon. You're growing great cabbage, and all of a sudden you've got all those holes. Uh, very common here. Cabbage looper. Cabbage looper is the larval form. How many people, it, it, in the summertime, you'll see these beautiful little white butterflies? 
and um, they have little black dots on their wings. And you think, oh, what a beautiful butterfly. No, no, that's the adult form of the cabbage looper. And what she's done is she's laid her little egg there. So again, it's on the back of the leaves. One little old white egg like that, and then many times as they go on, you'll see them begin to cluster. So anyway, that's, look at the back of, your, uh, back of your leaves. Cucumber beetle, you'll find these guys. They look like a beautiful green ladybug. They are not. They will eat your leaves and the vines and the fruits out of the flowers of the cucumber. They come in two forms. They're spotted. They also come in striped. Same color, but striped instead of spotted. I neglected to put the spotted picture in here, and, I, and I'm sorry. Blossom end rot. How many people have seen this on a tomato? Okay, so it looks like this to begin with, this little soft spot. And then if you don't catch it, it turns into that. It also affects your peppers. It's called blossom end rot. Now, the rest of the fruit's fine. So if you get this, you can cut that out and still eat the rest of it. It hasn't affected the taste or the quality or anything. But what's that from? Anybody know? Irregular watering. Yeah, and what does the irregular watering cause? It comes from a lack of calcium, decreased calcium uh, availability. Calcium deficiency, and it can cause it in two ways. Number one, because maybe you actually have a deficiency of calcium. But number two, when you water irregularly on your tomatoes, the calcium does not, is, is, not, is no longer readily available. It just gets all tied up. I, I, I'm guilty of this. I'm very guilty of, okay, I'll water those tomatoes later. I'm really for work, and I've got to get down there. i got to get to Ann's place, and I can't make it to Ann's place on time, so the tomatoes are going to have to wait for me. And then by the time you, oh, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> God, she does everything. <laughs> thank you. And then by the time I get home, the tomatoes are wilted. Okay. So first thing, the problem with the wilt is that any time your plants wilt, you are causing damage to the cells because the cells have collapsed. Yes, most of the time you can get it to rise up again, but you've got some damage that's happened there. All right, but the second thing is, when you do the irregular watering, the calcium is not taken up properly. If you th but if you know that you've been on a drip system and it's been regular, watered regularly, same time every day, same time every two days, whatever you're doing, just try adding a little calcium. And you can do that a number of ways. You can buy a bag of calcium nitrate. This has got calcium and a little nitrogen in it. You can buy a liquid. I didn't bring it in, but I brought it with me. I don't think I brought it in. You can buy liquid calcium. I've got one in the car that's calcium and zinc. Oh, that's, that's Super Thrive. I didn't tell you guys about this. But uh, this doesn't have calcium in it, so I'll go to that in a minute. But cal uh, you can do that. Or the other thing, how often do you go to a nursery and they say, we want you to add gypsum to your soil because it's, gonna, it's going to dissolve your caliche. Anybody ever been advised to buy gypsum for your soil? There's no need to put gypsum in your soil. Unless you live in Wilcox, gypsum is for sodic soils, very, very high sodic or saline soils. And what it does in a saline soil is it gets into the, uh, chemically it gets into the bonds of the sodium and chloride and kind of breaks things up so that it's released in the soil. It's a whole chemical reaction. It has nothing to do with your caliche. And I don't know where that thing came from. The only thing that I've ever used gypsum for, so gypsum is, Calcium sulfate. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. Caliche, yeah. And so if I've got a bag of gypsum sitting around, and I've done this before, all of a sudden I've got some blossom end rot, end rot, I'll add a little gypsum to my tomato patch. And the next load of tomatoes is blossom end rot free because I've used the calcium from the gypsum. But you don't need to put gypsum in your soil thinking it's going to break up your caliche. That, it doesn't work that way. Could yes. tomato fertilizer? Does it have a good amount of calcium in it? I never checked. But I was using tomato fertilizer. So this guy, this is from a brand called Arizona Best. I will tell you about them. They're right out of Tucson, but they're sold all over this part of the United States. Arizona Best is a little different because it laces their whole fertilizer with sulfur. Sulfur is an acidifier. So anytime you're fertilizing with an Arizona Best product, you get a little added bonus of a little sulfur so that you get a little added acidification to your soil. All right, and so this particular one was labeled for tomatoes and vegetables. Now that's the other thing, you guys. You don't have to have, when you go into the store, isn't that confusing? There's a fertilizer for, there's one for citrus, there's one for trees, and there's one for grass, and for shrubs, and for vegetables, and for roses, and you just go, what is all this stuff? 
Um, look at the different formulations. One might be 2020-20, one might be 1919-19, one might be 1918-17. It's all kind of essentially the same amounts of what we put there, okay? There, it's food is food, it's okay, you don't have to have one of everything on there. All right, but this particular thing is labeled for tomatoes and vegetables, and it has, it's 6% calcium. So it's got a little, yeah, I mean, it should be, it should be, but you know, you start getting symptoms, sometimes you just treat the symptoms. The other thing I heard about tomato fertilizer is you can use it on your fruit trees, well, that's on what I mean. your flowers, anything that you want to produce. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, so if you read this, it's on the back. This has got nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and all and iron and all the little things that you need. And it's just labeled for tomatoes. Pick up the next one that says roses. And then pick up the next one that says shrubs. They've all got those elements so you can... You know, it's like going into your fruit bowl and feeding your family. You know, it, you're going to be satisfied with the oranges and you're the apples and it's okay. It's, it's, it's food is food. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is the to tomato or the, the blossom end rot, is that uh, uh, associated at all with the cracking of the tomato? I don't believe so. I think the cracking has to do with the liquid content inside. I mean, the most common cause of cracking in the tomatoes is it gets so full of water they crack. Um, I see you shaking your head. What do you, do you have a, oh, oh, okay, so eggshells are indeed full of calcium, and you can put the eggshells in your soil. Problem is, is that it's very slow to break down and release the calcium. You can grind them up into a powder. Um, I, I've just read, though, that they're not as fast release on the calcium, as, so it's not a quick fix. Okay, all right, I'm going to see whatever pictures are quick, if there's anything else here that would help you. Caterpillar damage? Uh, to caterpillar damage, what's the best thing to reach for? Anything, if you've got caterpillars on trees, and there are, there are caterpillars that will take the ends of your trees down, usually it's toward the end of the season anyway, when you're about to lose the leaves to the season within three weeks, so sometimes you don't worry about it. But anything with BT, big B, little t, that stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria. So you'll see things that talk about this. This is Schultz caterpillar food, caterpillar remedy. And if, as long as it talks about Bacillus thuringiensis or BT, <clears throat> it's very specific for caterpillars. That's just the good thing about this stuff. It's not harmful to you or your pets or your beneficial insects or to any other plants. It's only specific to caterpillars only. And the caterpillars love this bacteria, so they eat it and then it destroys their reproductive and digestive systems. So it's very effective on caterpillars, won't hurt another thing. So if you've got a problem, take out the BT. This is a p common picture on tomatoes, verticillium wilt. <clears throat> it's a virus that's soil borne. There's nothing you can do about it. Sometimes you'll go out and you'll see it start to dry out on the bottom and you think something's wrong, but this is a virus. Um, there's another thing that looks very similar called fusarium wilt. Okay, and so that's when you're buying tomatoes and you pick up the tag, you know, you pick up your little tag and on the tag it might say VFN. Have anybody ever noticed that? or it will say V, N, or whatever. It sent, the V stands for verticillium wilt. F stands for fus... <clears throat> it's okay. F stands for fusarium wilt. N stands for those root knot nematodes. So if you see this on the tag, it means it's resistant to those. So it might only be resistant to verticillium wilt or N or ne nematodes, or maybe you'll only see an F. It might only be resistant to fusarium wilt. But when those letters are on your tags, that's what that means. And once you have verticillium wilt, there's nothing you can do about it. It's a soil-borne virus. Pull those. You don't, if it's still producing, go ahead and let it finish producing. It's not going to hurt your fruit. It's just going to decline your plant. Then when you take the plants out, don't compost them. Get rid of them. And probably, if you have a good patch of this, don't plant tomatoes there the next year. Rotate your crop. That's another very important point about integrated pest management is rotate the places where you plant things so that they don't get the same pest or disease year after year. Anybody know what that is? Good bug, bad bug. Just name that. Is it good or bad? Looks like a, looks like a bad guy, doesn't it? It's a good guy. You know what it is? Larval form of the ladybug. Yep. Yep. So that's what she looks like. And you know that in this larval form, she is a much more voracious eater than in the mature form. In fact, what do they call her? Like the aphid lion or something? That's her nickname. Okay. 
more it shows a, uh, aphids eating scale. They'll eat, I mean, the ladybug. The ladybugs will eat aphids, white flies, scale, a number of things. Um, lace wings. Lace wings. You'll see them in the lights in the summertime when you've got your patio lights on. She's a really good guy. She eats more aphids than the ladybug does. And, and if you ever buy them, like from places, there's a, if you ever tried to buy stuff to bring in, all the organic stuff, there's a place called R, and it's all in capitals. Jeez, Jan, I can't see close up. R B Co. Arbico Organics. It's right out of Tucson. It's you, it, people buy all over the nation. It's all organic stuff for fertilizing and treating and all sorts of things. You can buy ladybugs and beneficial insects and worms and all sorts of stuff from Arbico. And because they're right there in Tucson, you can even go to their retail store. But lacewings, if you happen to try to buy them to bring them in your garden, they'll hang around better than the ladybugs will because many times ladybugs will fly away. That's a lacewing from the top. These are lacewing eggs. Fascinating. You'll see these little guys hanging on these filaments off the bottom of a leaf. What's wrong with that stuff? Those are lacewing eggs. Very um, distinctive because they are built on the end of these filaments, and the filaments are there for protection so that predators on the leaves can't eat them. Okay, lacewing eggs. Anybody know what that is? That is a, a, an egg case for a praying mantis. A lot of people see those. And it does need to be a great big picture. Um, and they'll try to pick them off or throw the branch away. No, 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 no. So let me see. And then what happens is they'll do, this, this part here looks like a zipper that just kind of opens up and out they'll come. You will sometimes see holes in those cases, but that means that something else has gotten in there and tried to eat the babies. But that's the praying mantis, obviously full of egg, and then this is how tiny the little babies are. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, finished with slides. Those are just Real storms. Quick. Last yes. Last year, I had one of the verbenas that are low growing, and I had one right in the middle that was, wouldn't move, it was lazy, it would just reach its arm out and grab a butterfly. Oh. And I watched it for like an hour. Yeah. It was Aren't they something? They are. They really are. I agree. I have so much more I could talk about, but I'm not going to do it. I'm only going to let you guys guide me. Could I say one thing? Yes. Uh, Arbico, I bought uh, praying mantis egg casings uh -huh. from them, and I was very upset when I realized when they hatched how big they were, uh, the babies, and I looked up the particular variety they had. It's from China. Mm -hmm. It's not from this country. Oh. And Interesting. Those particular ones that that the scientific name that they gave me, make five to six inch size praying mantises and they will catch and kill hummingbirds. Oh, I've, I've, I've seen, seen it, have you all seen that, that one YouTube, YouTube that keeps so, circling yeah, around about, the, yeah, yes, where the praying mantis kills the hummingbird. And so I yeah. would, that's the one thing I've gotten from them that I think is really yeah, yeah. heinous. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Like I totally get it, totally get it. Um, I'll show you one more trick. Anybody have a patio or a wall that you want to cover, but at the base of the pillar or the wall, you don't have any soil? So see, that's where container gardening comes in. So maybe you've got this, here's your porch, and it's got a little veranda on it. And then, you know, you've got a pillar that comes up like this, and there's just nothing but concrete. Or there's a wall by your driveway, and you have no soil, but you want something on it. Then, you know, use a container. Use a beautiful con container. Here's a vine. You could do the vine, you can put the vine in your container, and then you could let that vine wrap around your pillar. You can put a little wire on the pillar, or you can put a trellis behind it up against a wall. And so that's just another idea. This could be a decorative vine, or it could be a grape vine, or a berry producing vine. We see you want to do all edibles, but don't forget your vines, and don't forget that you can do them in containers and grow them up on things. You don't need the ground to support a vine. It's just one less little thing I thought I'd throw in. Okay. You guys have been marvelous and patient, and I thank you so much. And I'll stay around for <laughs> thanks. And don't forget to decorate your pot. And don't forget to put a pillar light in it. Oh, and you know what else? Don't forget to put in a shepherd's hook. Make it a whole garden and hang a hummingbird feeder in it. You know, you've got that garden we talked about, you, or, you, or your favorite wind chime. Use shepherd's hooks in here. A shepherd hook and a solar light and a piece of decorative art, and you've got a fun expression of your personality. 
All righty. I want to yes. thank Jan. She spoke two and a half hours. Oh, gosh. That was way more than we paid for. <laughs> and everybody, everybody, but before, everybody, before everybody leaves, this is the first in our series of grow, growing vegetables outside your back door. So we're going to have another uh, workshop, and it's going to be in the garden, in our garden, which is just behind the library. Anybody who hasn't seen it, we're working there Tuesday mornings and Saturday mornings. You're welcome to come and visit and see the garden. A lot of what you've talked about we have in the garden in terms of vertical growing and so forth. Um, but the next one is going to be this young lady right here in the beautiful pink shirt. And what was the date? It's not July 19th or something like that. It's, it's not next Saturday or the following Saturday because of holidays and a conflict. And we'll we'll put it on our Facebook page. So look at Wachuca City Community Garden Facebook, and we'll have it there. And because you gave us your email, we will send you a, an invitation so that you will know about it. She's going to talk about straw bale garden. She's done it for some years now, and we've got it all set up in the garden. She'll show you how unique it is. And everybody goes straw bales. How can you do that? Well, you'll find out. She does a great job. So thank you for coming. Thank you.